You want to wait five? I'm totally fine with wait five. More. I would start whatever. Just start now. Just go. Okay, and we're live here at the Southeast Tech Hub. Uh, my name is Jesse Weeb. Thanks for joining me today. I am the community development lead with Startup TNT. I, I run a family office with my dad. I'll explain a little bit more about what that means in a bit. That's part of what we're talking about today is uh, investors, financial capital, um, and how to get it uh, through pitching and uh, other means. So uh, let me talk a little bit about Startup TNT and what it is that we do before we get started. So for those that don't know, the TNT in Startup TNT stands for Thursday Night Tradition. So it's starting back in May of 2019. We had a happy hour uh, on one of our co-founders' birthdays. Uh, and shortly thereafter, we developed the nonprofit, and we've been running a happy hour in now in five cities, uh, Edmonton, Calgary, Saskatoon, Regina, and Winnipeg. And we're going to be doing our first happy hour tonight here in Esteban for those that want to come join us. Um, so our motto is have fun, make friends, build companies. We do the have fun and we do the make friends with our community events on those Thursday nights. And we do the build companies through a program that we call the Investment Summit. If you want to learn more about that, please reach out, talk to me. Happy to tell you more about how that program works. Um, this is the key team. We actually have a couple more folks than that. As you can see, we're spread out across the prairies. Uh, we, we're, we've got headquarters up in Edmonton, but we've got folks in Calgary, Saskatoon, Regina, and Winnipeg uh, covering the whole prairies. Um, we work with a lot of different groups and organizations to make it happen. Um, it takes a village to, to build a community around startups, to build an ecosystem. It's really great what Gord's doing down here in the southeast. He's doing taking that same approach. And what is the effect of when you pull all those people together? and you're able to drive some investment into companies. Well, over 11 million capital raised for 84 companies over the last three and a half years. That's what we do at Startup TNT. We help facilitate that process. We help get companies to get investment and we help investors learn how to uh, invest in companies. And we've collected over 1,500 individual checks. If anybody who's ever raised capital knows or dealt with capital, that's a lot of checks. Uh, a lot of wrangling cats. That's what we're good at here at Startup TNT. Um, and just real quick before I get into the fun bits that you're all here for, I um, just wanted to talk a little bit more about what, what we're doing with regards to being investors. Um, so we're, uh, we're, just, we're trying to build a community. We're trying to make friends. Um, we're trying to build those relationships with you, the entrepreneurs here. Uh, we're trying to help grow the ecosystem. Uh, even if you're unsuccessful in raising capital from us on the first time, we want you to be able to grow and gain that confidence over time, get that education and keep coming back, learning uh, from each iteration. Uh, and we're here to, we're here to grow the, the ecosystem as a whole, grow the community. That's why I came all the way down here to Estevan uh, to support uh, today, to support this pitch competition, because uh, it's important that uh, we support innovation anywhere. Um, because I truly believe it can come from anywhere. Um, so I'm excited to, to meet some of you tonight and learn more about the companies that you're building. Um, yeah, we like to have fun while we're at it. So let's get to the fun part. Uh, all of you want to know more about uh, the money situation. Uh, before we dive into that, though, too, I know we have a chat going. If you want uh, to, to introduce yourself, I'd love to learn a little bit more. We got Gord. Uh, and his team monitoring the chat. They'll be feeding me any questions that you might have. Feel free to jump in at any point with questions in the chat. Happy to take them. I'm here for you. I'm here to help you learn. So that's what we're going to go through today. So first off, angels. What is an angel investor? Um, you've often heard this term. Uh, what, what it means is it's folks that are investing their own money. Right, so they've they've been, they've been successful uh, as an entrepreneur or in business uh, in some way, shape, or form. Maybe they won the lottery uh, in in some way, uh, and so they've got some extra money and they they invest really early. These are the people that are taking the high risk capital on you. Sometimes they're your friends and family. Sometimes they're they're entirely uh, uh, you know new people to you, uh, and you'll go out and you'll meet them in the ecosystem. They're typically investing part time but they can formalize into what's called a family office. 
So a family office is when a wealthy family decides that they're going to manage their portfolio, their money in a way that's more um, structured than just say, hey, giving it to a financial advisor. They're going to build a team around it. So there's a number of those organizations across this province um, that, that, have, that have formed over the years, including uh, my own family uh, just formed one recently. So that's what an angel is. And then you hear VCs or you hear venture capitalists. Well, what is a venture capitalist? Well, they're investing other people's money. They go out and they raise from what's called LPs or limited partners. Um, if you're interested in understanding kind of how the structure of all that works, I'm not going to dive into it today, but feel free to reach out to me uh, and, and I can explain kind of the, the deeper understanding of how uh, venture capital is raised by these firms. Um, but essentially, they go out and they find wealthy people, they find institutions, pension funds and the like that are interested in having exposure to early stage, high risk, high reward startup investments. And they invest in those companies with a very particular thesis. Um, so when investors talk about thesis, what they're meaning is it's the lens through which they invest. It's a framework. It's a decision matrix if you will, on how they decide whether or not you're a good fit for them because they see hundreds and thousands potentially of companies every year and they have to filter those down to the ones that make the most sense to them and to their uh, limited partners in their fund. Uh, and yeah, they're, they're pros. They're investing full time. Uh, so these are some of the VC firms that are, exist out here in the prairies. Startup TNT has invested... I think alongside all of them now, yeah. So, uh, and then you'll see our uh, our own VC fund down there in the corner. And then something to bear in mind here too. So, <clears throat> often that comes up in in startup land uh, is you got you have sort of venture capital and then you have private equity. They're two different things. So, in in startup TNT's lingo, we define startups as any company that is trying to scale globally, or larger at least than their own regional center. So if you're just trying to build a great, you know, coffee shop or, you know, some sort of local business, bike repair, whatever it is, that's awesome. You're a great entrepreneur. You might be able to raise a little bit of money, but you're probably going to raise it from these people and not from the venture capitalists. So private equity they're investing their own money or other people's money because sometimes they raise funds like Westcap here. But they're often looking to, to be ma major partners in your business. Uh, maybe they're going to you know, buy in for, for 40% or more. Uh, maybe they're going to potentially buy you out one day. Um, some of these firms <clears throat> like Pick and Westcap here, they also do VC as well. So you got to be kind of wary and careful about when you're interacting with these groups in terms of which path are you trying to go down and who are you pitching to? Because they're very different pitches when it comes to pitching to these two different groups. Um, yeah, I'm going to pause. Is there any questions in the chat? Yeah. Nothing yet? Okay. Um, but I hope everybody's understanding uh, what I'm going through here. Um, I'm going to break these down in a minute. But for those three groups, there are basically four common deal structures that can be used. Everybody usually knows about shares. We'll explain the difference between commons and preferreds in a minute. Um, you have convertible notes or convertible debt. Uh, this is uh, very common. Um, we use in all kinds of different business. And then in startups, in particular in venture capital, you have something called a SAFE, a simple agreement for future equity. And I'll explain what that is in a minute. Um, it's kind of a unique uh, instrument. Um, essentially, it's a convertible note with no interest, but I'll explain what that all what that all means. Um, What's the difference again between and I will get into that, like yeah, in a minute. But first, I want to get to the stuff that you can get for relative free. Get that get that free money, or get that money without dilution, which basically means you don't have to give up ownership in your company to get the money. So those three groups that I talked about earlier. Any, or any sort of private investor, you're going to have to give up ownership in your company to get the money. For these ones, you just have to do a lot of work. So first off, pitch competitions. They're a really great way to get some money. Um, you obviously, you're all signed up for this one. There are a bunch of other ones that I recommend you check out. Colabs and Cultivator in particular have some really great programs. 
I uh, highly recommend you check those out. Um, and yeah, some great reasons why you do it. You're all here for that reason, to get that experience, hone your craft, learn more about how uh, your company works through the process of crafting your pitch, um, and hopefully win some money while you're at it and get some of that exposure. Um, grants. So when we look at a company, and I will ask them often, what grants do you have? In particular, this one. This is one I really want to know about because if you're a startup and you're looking to scale and you don't have IRAP, there must be something wrong because IRAP is basically a filter, right? They do a lot of work to determine what companies are actually building more innovative technologies and they provide, they provide a lot of funding to a lot of companies and, they're, and they have a relatively low barrier to entry. So if you can't even clear that hurdle and get IRAP funding, you're probably not going to be able to get funding from a venture capitalist if you're building a large, scalable company. Um, so that's sort of a, a little tip and trick there on the grant side. But I highly recommend you look into grants first before you look into any sort of private capital option. Um, this is a really, uh, basically they're entirely free money. You are going to probably have to write out some um, reports typically. Uh, and you're going to have to have regular meetings. IRAP, they have uh, what's called an ITA. They're an advisor. They meet with you regularly. They check in on the projects that you've applied for funding for. Uh, and if you're not meeting those KPIs, if you're not showing progress, uh, you'll lose the funding or you won't, or you won't get renewed. Sorry, you won't, you won't so much lose the funding, you just won't be able to get more. Um, there's a lot of pay paperwork that you're going to have to do in order to be successful at getting your grants. Um, so Perhaps think about hiring a grant writer. Um, one thing to, to keep in mind is that there are a lot of uh, snake oil salesmen out there when it comes to grant writers. So do your due diligence on it. Check in with Gord. Check in with us at Startup TNT. We have plenty of folks that we know that are great grant writers that don't screw over founders and know how to follow the rules in such a way. Because there are particular rules, too, with how you set up your engagements with grant writers. If you set it up wrong, you can't get the grants. So... Um, keep that in mind. Well, I mean, the reporting is, is is some of the the biggest. I think another piece too that can happen for companies it, it can be a bit of a distraction with the grants, in so much that they'll go after niche grants that are relative to your company because you want the free money, but aren't really relevant to what the core of your business is actually trying to accomplish. And so you're, you're just constantly working on these, these sort of secondary and side things. Um, grants also have, often have a long cycle to deal with. Um, and uh, there can be a lot of uh, time and, and folks um, in startup land, you know, you need your money quickly. Um, and if it takes too long to, to get it, um, often uh, the project that you wanted to take advantage of with the grant has already passed, right? So I've, I've talked to companies where they, they said, oh, yeah, we're, we're going to apply for this. Six months later, they finally get it. We're like, well, the opportunity is not there anymore because I've already moved on because uh, you're moving so quickly uh, when you're building your company. So that's, that's another thing to keep in mind, um, the grants. Any? No? No? Okay. Oh, wait. All right, no problem. I'll just keep going. All right, uh, so shred credits. Um, S R E D. Uh, this is uh, the research uh, and development credits. Um, essentially, federal government has determined if any of your employees are working in research and development, you can write off part of their salary. Uh, to reduce your corporate tax burden and you get it as like a refund. So after you've filed all your taxes, <clears throat> you'll do a second filing to get your shred credits back and then you get like a nice big check in the mail uh, from shred. Um, that's where a lot of snake is. Again, yes. That's where I say use a good consultant. One of our favorites with uh, Startup TNT is a, is a group called Infinity Shred, uh, Saskatoon. Uh, Dana McCall and Andrew Cudell and their crew are, do a great job. There's also folks called Boast, Boast AI. Um, they um, 
are out of Vancouver. They've also developed a whole sort of AI system to try to make it faster and more efficient. If anybody wants introductions to these folks at, with Shred, happy to make those for you. Um, one that um, doesn't often come up uh, in Startup Plan, but I thought it would be relevant here to this group, um, is the CDAP grant, the, the Canadian Digital Adoption Plan. Um, it's basically government grant money that allows you to do uh, development around uh, your, your digital marketing strategy, your tech stack. Uh, so for more like traditional businesses or tech enabled uh, businesses, you might not be building say a software platform or some type of hardware. Maybe it's a more traditional business, uh, but you've, you've built some sort of tech around it or you wanna develop some skill set within it. Um, check out the CDAC grant. There's like 10 to $15,000 worth of money there um, to help get that off the ground. Yeah. That's a good one. Uh, a lot of folks know about debt financing. Um, that's often sort of the first thing people think of when they're like, but it's that and like, I can raise money like on Dragon's Den. Um, those are kind of the two things that people really know about in the mainstream. You can get a loan, right? Um, BDC, I would say, is probably the one that's m most friendly for early stage, really early stage founders. Once you've hit basically $50,000 in revenue, they will take a look at you and, uh, and potentially give you a loan of like fifty dollars to $100,000 uh, to help you get off the ground. But there are, right now, there is very high interest rates. So keep that in mind. You have to be able to, to fund this off your cash flow. Something I will bear in mind too, when you do that BDC loan early stage, they are gonna ask for personal liability on that, meaning you are gonna have to essentially sign your house. Uh, or whatever it is that you have in terms of assets, um, you will have to, to put that as collateral on the loan. So that is a uh, important thing to keep in mind. One thing I will say on that, BDC has never taken anybody's house. You know, you're not going to become homeless because of it. So I know some folks get a little scary when they're like, oh my God, I got to put my house up. Um, but uh, uh Basically, they're they're just gonna they're, they'll put a small lien on it, and eventually they'll pay it out. But they're not they're not taking anybody's home away from them. Um, that really what it's good for it, it's for bridging those gaps in capital, right? When you've got those chunky cash flows, or say you've got a large contract that that re re uh, renews on an annual basis uh, for a large sum of money, but you need cash flow intermittently between that. Well, debt financing can come in here, especially when you know that you've got these large, chunky capital flows coming in from various contracts so that you can pay off the loans. Um, there is going to be a lot of reporting requirements, so keep that in mind. Are you able to handle that reporting requirements? And uh, the other thing to keep in mind is if you pick a good financial partner, so those three there are ones that I like, uh, they will actually help you with more things, right? They'll build relationships for you, especially with BDC and RBCX in the venture capital and startup world. They have a lot of relationships there. They can open doors for you. So not only are you getting the money, but you're also getting the relationships and the connections that that organization has. For reporting requirements, are you going to need an accountant to help you with that? Is it that complex or is it what? You, you probably will. Yes, you will need, you will need an accountant uh, in order to... Uh, and you, you'll need an accountant even in the in the um, in private investing world if you're getting the capital. Uh, often a, a requirement uh, is is information that has to be provided to uh, to your um, financial partner or um, uh, your your investors. Uh, an audited financial statement every year is going to have to be provided, and so obviously you will need a uh, an accounting firm. To, uh, to help you with that. I recommend MNP. <laughs> um, another one to keep in mind, especially for companies uh, that have regular cash flow and have a relative, or you've sort of gotten to a more stable income, um, is an operating line of credit. Um, essentially, it's debt financing, but it's not like you're getting all the money at once. You can pull the money out as you need it and uh, pay it down uh, as you go. Um, there are also zero interest loans. Praise Can has zero interest loans. 
We're good. Okay. Yeah, it has zero interest loans, but those are only for scale-up companies. So you really have to hit a certain point in order to get the the you know free money. Um, I should mention too on the interest thing when I mentioned BDC earlier. One of the reasons I also like BDC is it's interest only payments for the first year, so it keeps it a little easier uh, that you don't have to uh, pay down as much in that first year, so you can really use the money to get ahead. Um, venture debt is another thing else that comes up. So essentially, that's where they provide debt and they get a warrant of your company. A warrant is a uh, piece of paper that gives that. Holder of the warrant, the ability to buy shares of your company at a prearranged price in the future. Um, so you will have to raise venture capital first in order to get the venture debt. Uh, this last one here, too, is one that I, I really wanted to bring up here um, because it, it has helped a number of companies that I know get out of some very tricky situations where they've kind of hit end of runway. Uh, or, or you know, had potentially been looking for some some short term financing. Getting financing on your shred um, can be a good way to manage your cash flow. I, yeah, as I said, I've had companies pull themselves off, uh, pull themselves out of the brink by doing some shred financing to get through. So, I think some people might find it complicated to go there or overrun it. Where would a good place for someone who wants to get more info on that? Would their account know stuff like this? M and B. MNP would, would absolutely know stuff on this. I mentioned Boast earlier. Boast actually does shred financing okay. um, as well. How about like with the venture debt stuff? Venture debt. Um, National Bank of Canada has been getting into that a bit more uh, lately. Um, but that is is often something, as you said, you're going to raise the venture capital firm. The great venture capital firm that you're you're going to be raising the money from will probably uh, work with you on the venture debt if that's something that you need to get. Um, yeah, Prairies can recommend you chat with them as well as Innovation Saskatchewan. Uh, like probably at some point in the early stage to just get a sense of what your possibilities are for your business, and then you have some sort of milestones that you can work towards. All right, I think that's the last of those ones. So we're going to dive into private investment. So common shares, aka founder shares, it's the shares that you own of your business, right? So it's a very simple equity ownership. Um, I recommend you do more than say like 100, like try to do higher multiples because it makes for easier math right out of the gate. But say you have 100 shares of your company, um, you as the founder of the company, you own 70%, you bring on an early business partner, they own 20%, and then you have a 10% allocation for any future employees, right? That uh, means so you have a 7, 70, 20, 10 split on your business. And then if you go and sell additional shares of the business, say you sell 20% of your company, this is where dilution comes in. Because what you're doing is you're not selling your shares, right? You're creating new ones and then selling those. So what that means is, is that if I add an additional 20 shares to sell 20%, it actually ends up being a little bit, I think it's 21 or 22 shares to actually do the math on 120. So you end up with 120 shares. You're, if you owned 70 before, now you own 70 divided by 120 instead of 70 divided by 100, right? So your, your percentage of the company that you own goes down by 20%, right? But, it go, but everybody else's also goes down. So it's dilution across the board, right? So that's the important things to keep in mind when you are working with common shares. Um, Couple things to keep in mind here too, um, and I'd be happy to like dive into this some more. But this, there is some nuance to all this. Is when you value your say, I value the company at a million dollars, right? And you say sell twenty percent of it, meaning two hundred thousand, right? Comes into the company. The company is now worth one point two million, right? But then you go out and you sell the company for. 800,000, 
Well, now those original investors, because they're on common shares, lose a little bit of money. You obviously make money because you started at zero, right? And now you're selling the company for 800,000 and you're getting something like 60% of the company at the end, 60% of that number at the end. <clears throat> but those other investors got a little bit screwed, so they're not gonna be happy, right? So that's often why common shares are not used by sophisticated investors because there's the potential that they will lose money on that post uh, on the change in the post money valuation, right? So that's something to keep in mind is sort of that dynamics between you and the potential investor around common shares. That's why they don't buy in on common shares. That's why they buy in on preferreds, which I will explain in a minute. Uh, something also to keep in mind is make sure your USA and your shareholder rights are set up properly, right? So if you need a great lawyer, check out McCurcher Law Firm, Joe Gill. Uh, he will set you up for success. Uh, he has very reasonable rates too. I think it's like a thousand dollars to get started. So check them out. Um, with McCurcher, he's in Saskatoon, uh, and then he's got a colleague up in Regina, um, or a few colleagues in Regina that uh, you can happily connect with as well. Uh, they'd be uh, more than willing to work with you. Um, but be very careful how you set those things up, because especially with with common shares, common shares are also voting shares. Meaning in the event of something crazy happening like an M&A, sometimes people have their shareholder rights set up in such a way that um, you need everybody to vote yes. And if you have one tiny little investor shareholder that you can't get a hold of or is unwilling to vote yes, you can hold up a whole deal and then you can end up losing a potential acquisition offer or something like that because you didn't set up your shareholder right agreements from the get-go properly. Um, so when you are thinking about negotiating around a sale of common shares, right, this will usually come up with adding on additional founders. That's mostly will come up. There are some unsophisticated angel investors that insist on common shares. There are also a couple of VCs that we know that insist on common shares. We think they're weird, but whatever. Um, the, the valuation for price of share determines what percentage of the company you own, right? So be careful about setting up your valuations and stuff, especially early on. If you, if you value your company too high early on, it can set you up for failure later on. As much as it feels nice to say I own shares of a million, two million, three million dollar company, um, if you set that bar too high early, you have to work to meet that valuation down the road. And if you can't accomplish that, then you're gonna fall short of your milestones and then you're not gonna be able to raise additional capital to keep moving. Um, I'll give you a little tip here too. Um, check out the data on Carta. They're um, an awesome data insights um, for, for founders. Uh, they have a bunch of free information is available for anybody, I think, making less or has raised less than a million dollars. You can sign up for their whole platform for free and they'll let you play around with this stuff. When you're thinking about adding other founders, never split your company like 50-50. Somebody needs to own a majority of the company and be making most of the decisions, right? And also think about potentially doing some sort of earn schedule Right, so when you add somebody onto your business and they're gonna come in as a co-founder, don't just give them 20% of the company right out of the gate, make them earn it, right, over a period of time. How do you spell Carta? Carta, C-A-R-T-A, -A, Carta. Yeah, and then I mentioned this earlier, um, the shareholder rights, um, that, that's often gonna come up in the negotiations, um, especially board seats, that's gonna come up uh, a decent amount with, with, especially with venture capital and private equity firms. Uh, angel investors sometimes will want a board seat, um, but usually it's the more sophisticated investors. So, so I mentioned the sort of downside of common shares uh, with, with regards to um, why VCs uh, are, are, are a little worried about them um, because there's that potential uh, for you to sell the company out from under them and they lose a bunch of money. So we created something called preferred shares. So preferred shares um, can uh, have sort of two uh, possible um, 
terms on top of them. There's participating, not participating is one, and then uh, a liquidation preference is the second, right? So I'll explain the second one first. So liquidation preference, all that means, if there's a 1x on it, means I get, in the event that the company sells, like I mentioned earlier, I did that little example, when if you were to sell that company for less than we originally invested in, you have to give me 1x of my money, you have to give me my money back. So if you sell the, if I bought in at the company at a million and then you sell the company for 800,000, you have to give me my $200,000 back. And then you get your percentage of what's remaining. Of that $600,000 that's remaining from the sale, you would get your percentage thereafter. The second, the, the first one I mentioned, the participating versus non-participating, right? It's not very common to uh, to be the, the sort of, uh, what is it, uh, the participating option, sorry. Uh, not participating is, is way more common. But essentially what it means is there's, there's a potential that I can have my cake and I can eat it too. Meaning not only do I get my 1x liquidation preference, but if I have participating preferreds, I also then get to convert to common equivalent and get that on top. So what does that mean? Well, in this scenario, if we sell the company for 800,000, I own 20%, I get my $200,000 back, and then I get 20% of the $600,000 on top of that, right? So if someone's really trying to get you on participating preferreds, say no. <laughs> Because it's not common, it's very not common. We've looked at the data. It has come back a little bit more recently because of some of the downturns in venture capital, but it's really with some of the later stage companies. If you're at the early, early stage and you're talking to anybody about participating for preferreds, um, yeah, you, you don't need to take their money. Go to somebody else. Um, but yeah, any sophisticated investor should be looking for preferred shares. Uh, again, um, Potential problems there is the USA and shareholder rights, particularly with well, and I'll say with preferreds and with commons. When you're when you're doing a deal, because you have to do so much on this part, costs a lot of money legally, right? So say you're raising two hundred thousand dollars, you're probably going to spend twenty five to fifty thousand dollars of that on legal, right? So now you're only raising one hundred and seventy five, hundred and fifty thousand, right? So you're actually losing a whole bunch of money when you have very limited funds. And the reason I bring this up is because it's going to explain why you might want to use one of the third or fourth options that I'm going to explain in just a minute. Um, so, yeah, that's where I mentioned the relatively expensive. One more question. Just structure. Yeah. I uh, just go back for a sec. Uh -huh. I just turn on this mic so it can come through. Uh, just again, so if you have a preferred non-participating and then you go, uh, you exit, and you have your cash. So say again, using your million, and then you sell for eight hundred thousand. Yeah. Um, he gets his two hundred thousand back. In non-participating, he that person will won't also get a percentage. They just get their money back. Yeah. So, so that's they're like that's a minimum. In other words, you could say it's a minimum for exit. So if it was the other way around, where they sold for two million. Yes. They then they would get. They would percentage. convert to commons. Yeah. Right before the transaction yeah. and then get 20 percent back. Basically, it creates uh, yeah, it creates a minimum return um, that they get back. So often VC firms um, that are you know, when they invest a little further along, will put actually a 2x liquidation preference because they want at least a guarantee of the double their money back. Um, and so that that sets a, a bar by which you have to clear in terms of a, a, a sale valuation. So for the keeners here in the class, something that has come up a decent amount lately is there are companies out there, uh, Instacart was an example of this, and this is one of the reasons they went public, um, is that you have what's called a preference stack overhang, right? So if you have a whole bunch of these stacks on top, so say I've got a 3X, a 2X, and a 2X, but I can value what those are based on what the original investment is. So say your company is... Um, worth a billion dollars, Instacart, right? But you have a preference over stack on that of $2 billion, which means you are actually underwater, right? And so that as a founder, you're getting nothing, right? So you know, one of the things to be wary of here too, and this is why we're also going to get into why you should probably use number three or four when it comes to deal structures at the really early stage, is that you want to start that, that preference stack stacking as late as possible, Right, because in, because what will happen is is when the first investor comes in, they want one x. Well, the next investor wants two x. The next investor after that wants three x. Right, 
and it can go and go and go and going on from there. Right, 3x is usually the high point of where any liquidation preference is going is going to go. I haven't seen or heard too much about like four or five, six x plus, um, but Do it is possible. Do you have a slide later on on how you might deal with going under when you're underwater and you have no choice and you have to exit, or is that just so messy that's just not worth talking about? Yeah, that's really messy. Not worth talking about. I'll just okay. yeah, for the keeners in the class, the reason why I mentioned the Instacart thing is that when you go public. Um, all their preferred shares get cleared and converted to commons. So if you want to clear the stack, that is one option is to go public. I'm the keener. Yeah. Because <laughs> you guys ain't asking. Yeah. Um, again, um, you know, the key terms here on preferred shares, it, you are valuing the company. Um, so be, be wary of that. You do have all those various shareholder rights. Um, and then you got to be thinking about those, as I said, those preference terms that participating versus non-participating. Yeah, and as I mentioned, participating isn't a common practice. All right, so we mentioned these commons, dealing with commons, dealing with preferreds, can be very hairy, a lot of work, costs a lot of money. Um, so instead, what's often used is a convertible note. So what a convertible note is, is essentially it's a debt that can convert to equity, right? And so one of the reasons why investors like this is it acts like a preferred share because it's debt you have to pay back in the event that you act, that you exit, because again, for the eight, that lower than I invested, you know, eight, if you exit for 800,000, on top of that, I'm also getting interest, right? And it's accumulating. So over time, I'm getting more and more percentage of your company in the event that the note converts. Right, so what often on convertible notes will have a maturity date. So typically it's two to three years. I recommend three, just to give yourself enough time uh, on that. Uh, in addition, uh, there, there's an option. There's usually a what's called qualified equity financing clause. So in the event that you hit a certain threshold on a future round of financing, the note auto converts into what has been already predetermined. Right. So with a convertible note, I'll explain. Yeah, I get to it in the next one. Yeah. So hey, with a convertible note, you have two things. You have the, or you have three things. Sorry, you have a valuation cap, a discount, and the interest rate. Uh, and I'll explain what all that means in just a minute. Um, but yeah, the the sort of high level, the the issues here is um, especially for the investors. You aren't you don't have shareholder rights, um, and it can be a little bit more complicated to structure. Um, and then from the founder side, uh, I should have mentioned here as well, um, it does act as debt on your balance sheet. So if you have too many convertible notes outstanding and you have a lot of debt, you're not going to be able to get bank financing. You're not going to be able to get uh, um, potentially other loans um, because they're going to be worried that this debt is sitting above theirs. Uh, they're not going to get paid back. You're, 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 there's too much going on. So... Um, that's something to keep in mind too with the convertible debt uh, when it comes to uh, to you as a founder. So yeah, I mentioned some of the key terms here. Um, valuation cap. So a valuation cap with a convertible note, there's a lot of debate about what that is, right? Because what it is, what what it, what, it, what is actually happening here, and I wish maybe I had a whiteboard because I could, oh, I do have a whiteboard. You do. Right I there. could. Um, maybe in a minute. Um, if anyone really wants me to go into it, because there's like, this is this is the complicated part. Um, so essentially with, with uh, a valuation cap, in the event that your company, um, so say you set your valuation cap at a million dollars. In the event that your company then goes out and raises a price round of equity, meaning someone is actually putting buying real either preferred shares or common shares, real shares of your business, and, and putting a real value on your company. And when that happens, the convertible note will convert at a million dollars instead of at the price that was set in that round. Where it gets a little complicated is with the discount. So what the discount means is that in the event that you don't raise above that valuation cap, 
I get the discount instead. The market rate for the discount is 20%. Right? And so, uh, yeah, so what that means is, and then, so, so with 20% as a valuation cap, you'd have to raise above 1.2 million on a 1 million valuation cap in order for me to get the valuation cap instead of the discount, right? As an investor, I always want the valuation cap to happen because that means something, that means everything's going according to plan, everything's good, right? Because if, as a sophisticated investor, I'm setting the valuation cap as an approximation of your valuation today. Where often where I've seen founders get a little hung up is on the discount, where they think the discount is awesome at 20%, you're like, you're getting 20% off the next round, man. That's great. It's actually not. It's only 1.25 times my money on the next round. One divided by 0.8. Right? So I only I only get 1.25 times my money. A great venture capital investor will want three times their money between rounds of investment. So that's why as a good uh, investor, when I'm doing convertible notes and safes, I make sure the valuation cap is set to the valuation today, right? But I have gotten in arguments with founders, especially in, I'll be honest, in rural Saskatchewan, <laughs> we're trying to understand how this stuff works, uh, that they think the discount is super exciting, the valuation cap is sort of like a future um, state of the company, um, right? But if you're, doing it, if you're doing it right, and here's also too, when you're in a conversation with, with venture capitalists, and they tell you about, and they say, we're, we're good with a valuation cap, of eight million, be very clear if that if they mean pre money or post money, right? So if they're investing two million dollars at an eight million valuation cap, that means your post money valuation is ten million, right? And there's a very big difference in the math that ends up happening between pre money and post money. If you really want to understand that better, we have some great sessions with our very own Tim Lin. Uh, he's our our deal specialist at Startup TNT. He's talked a bunch about about this stuff. You can check it up uh, on our YouTube page if you want to learn more. Um, interest rate. So here's uh, the important thing to think about on the interest rate and the term, um, particularly the interest rate. Essentially, what's happening is with a convertible note, every time that interest rate, like the interest ticks up, you're losing a little bit more of your company, right? So what convertible notes do for you as a founder is they put you on the clock, right? So you need to raise the next round of money and turn, like basically convert the note. Ideally, sometime before the maturity date, because if you wait all the way to the end, you're giving up the maximum amount that you could on that note, right? So that's often also where some investors really like convertible notes because it puts pressure on you as a founder to get things done, right? Um, something to keep in mind too, um, with other terms, um, yeah, I mentioned by the way, the, the, the term length, uh, three years, is, uh, is what we recommend. And then interest rate, somewhere around six, 8% is kind of average right now. Um, anything less than that, most investors scoff at because it's like not even above prime rate, which is like 5% right now. Um, so yeah, other terms, information rates, they'll often be a side letter, what's called a side letter uh, to a convertible note. What that essentially is, is it's just a separate side agreement that you're gonna share information with them. The reason why investors like to do a side letter is because um, when the note converts, they lose some of those rights and they want to make sure that they have them regardless of the note existence or not. Um, so I think also to, to, to bear in mind is the optional conversion structure and what happens if say like the investor decides to call the note. So keep that in mind. Um, and, and sometimes the startups will have like the founders will do this. So they'll, they'll set up some conversive comments. Most sophisticated investors, and I'll tell you, the startup TNT now pushes on all the convertible notes. They have to convert to preferred to preferred shares uh, in order for us to uh, to do the deal. Yeah. What's Any? more common, uh, converting to common or preferred? Even because now I think with venture capital investors, it's it's converting into preferred shares. Yeah, because it's too interesting. Yeah. Well, you have to like. The other thing to keep in mind on the investor side with the convertible note, and then when I get into it, the safe, which is coming next, is as a, as an, as a sophisticated investor, I have to know that there's a strong likelihood that you're going to go out and raise a larger round of financing of preferred shares or common shares, right? 
So if, if you're only going to ever raise money like once, right, I'm probably not going to invest on a convertible instrument because it's not going to convert, right? I, as much as like the, you know, I'm getting an interest rate, I'm making money, right, off of it. I don't want just want my money back. The reason why I'm investing in your company is because I want a huge return. I want you to give me 10x plus my money back. I want this thing to convert. I want it to convert, right? So if it's if I think there's a strong likelihood that you're not going to convert it, maybe then I'm going to put in an optional conversion structure. We've done that before, where we, in the event that uh, we think this company is going to turn into more of a private equity, spinning out dividends, it's going to give me cash at the end of the day. I have a conversion structure in there where it will it'll automatically convert. I, I can force it to convert into commons on my option, right? Um, or it'll convert automatically, say, at maturity, right? So those are, so those are some of the things that you can think about in the negotiation uh, with investors as well. Um, yeah, okay, safes. Um, so this was invented by Y Combinator. Uh, y Combinator is considered the most premier tech incubator in the world. Um, and they basically realized, well, yeah, convertible notes are problematic for a number of reasons. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, they sit on your balance sheet as debt. They have that interest rate ticking away, messing with your head, maybe making you feel a little screwy, right? We don't want that. We want you focused on your business. Yeah. We want you building your company. And uh, we also don't want to have to like do a ton of work to put the deal in place, right? I don't want to go through all the negotiation on the convertible note. I don't want to go through the negotiations on the share structure. Let's just get a deal done now and let's kick the uh, bucket down the road when it comes to valuation. So we have a safe. So a simple agreement for future equity. Essentially, as I said, it's a convertible note with no interest. This is a, uh, it is often said that it is off balance sheet by some people, it's not, right? Balance sheet has to balance, money comes in somewhere. It's essentially, it just, it sits off the cap table though, right? Meaning like a convertible note, I have a pretty good idea of what percentage of the company I'm gonna own, but I don't actually own anything of the company yet. It's just, it's just a piece of paper that says, in the event that you raise X amount of dollars, uh, I get this much of your company at a valuation cap or a discount. Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, depending on the structure, it might not convert. This is uh, a, a, something to keep in mind too, is if you are raising on a safe, that you should, um, or you're raising on any convertible instrument, try to do your rounds in such a way that you're gonna do a convertible priced round, convertible priced round, right? That's sort of a, the best, best practice. If you're, um, at any point, if you're raising like multiple stacks of convertible instruments on top of each other, um, that can create um, a lot of weird situations for you as a founder, where we've seen this happen where all of a sudden all the things convert and you own like less than 40% of your company, right? Um, because you didn't keep track of all the dilution that was actually happening if these were to convert. Um, uh, yeah, so with regards to um, sort of the liquidation preference, the, 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 there's, a, there's a few terms in a safe um, lately um, that um, are there to kind of protect people. I'll mention them down here. Uh, there's the information rights, um, but there's a often a uh, there's a liquidation. There's essentially a liquidation preference on the safe. So in the event that the company sells, as I mentioned, for less, you'll have to pay the safe out. A lot of safes have that now. Um, they also have a, a dividend clause in there. So as a as an owner of your company, you can give yourself dividends. Um, Sometimes that would mean essentially you're like going to dole out all the cash out of the company and take it all away from the investors in order to prevent that from happening. Uh, they, they put in a clause. Um, I, I'm not assuming that any of you are malicious in any way, but that you can do that, that, that if you're not set up properly. Um, so that's where more sophisticated investors will try to prevent that from happening. And then I mentioned earlier as well, the same situation as the convertible now with the valuation cap and the discount, right? So as I mentioned, valuation cap, approximation of the valuation today, right? So if you're if you're doing it right, 
um, in the negotiations, um, the valuation cap should be relatively accurate to to where you are valued today. Do you have any tools that you would recommend to deal with uh, handling or keeping track of your des your dissolution? Yes. So I mentioned Carta earlier. Carta, as I said, up to the first million dollar raised. Uh, you get free access to all their software. They have a whole cap table software, and you can actually play around with different scenarios where you can essentially, um, you know, estimate like say, uh, my first round of investments at a million dollar valuation. My second one's going to be at three million. My you know third one's going to be at ten million. Uh, I think I'm going to raise you know X Y Z dollars. Well, how does that all play out over time? Um, Card allows you to do all of that, play around with all of that. Keep track of everybody on your cap table. Really great software. Yeah, highly recommend that one. So, um, yeah, so those are the four deal structures. Um, do we have any other questions about those? I'm happy to like go through them. Yeah, I know there's a few of you listening, and there's, it was relatively complicated. Um, if if you want a great material on this. Um, I actually realize I have a couple copies in the back of my car, so I'm going to give one to Gord here before I leave. Uh, Venture Deals, really great book. It's by a gentleman by the name of Brad Feld, who actually recently invested in a Saskatchewan company, Vendasta. So he might be coming out here in May, come out to Uniting the Prairies in Saskatoon, uh, and you can meet him. Um, so Venture Deals, it's written by a VC and a lawyer for founders, so you don't get screwed. Right, that's literally how it's written. There's multiple points in there saying if it, if a VC says this, run. Like, <laughs> it's really really helpful. It's a bible for us at Start of TNT. So if you really want to understand how all this works, highly recommend you check out the Venture Deals book. And for all of you that kind of joined in late, I will post this on our face on our uh, website so you can go back and watch the first hour. Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, I mentioned dilution um, as well earlier. Um, so what's called the cap table. So cap table is just capitalization. It's a list of all of your shareholders. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, essentially dilution, uh, how it works is it, it, it's a, it, it comes uh, when you sell shares, you're actually creating new shares. So then it changes the percentage that you own of the company, right? So this is where it talks about uh, fully diluted basis. Um, that's when you're taking into account all the different shares that are in there, including the stock options, right? So this is also something that's really important to keep in mind too, um, as a founder. You should always have a stock option pool, right? It should be at least 10%. Um, if you think you're gonna need to hire a lot of really key people, to run your company, you should probably bump it up to closer to 20%. Um, getting that set up right off, right out of the gate um, is really helpful um, for hiring. Um, there's a couple things you should keep in mind too with the, with the option pool. Uh, as I mentioned, you should have what's called a vesting schedule. Um, so a vesting schedule means that you don't get all of the options that, that are allocated to you. So say you get hired by a, a startup and they say, okay, we're gonna give you 5% of the company, right? But it's gonna vest over four years, and it's gonna have a one year cliff. So what that means is, is that you take the 5% and you divide it into four equal portions, right? And that one portion is the first year, right? I get that at the end of my first year, meaning I get nothing for a whole year and then I get all my options. I get all my options for that first year at once. It, the reason why you would all do this as a founder is so you keep them from leaving your company after just a few months because and with five percent of your business, right? You don't want that, right? Having somebody out there that's no longer working for your business at the really early stage that owns like a majority stake, majority meaning anything five percent and higher, right? It's called a majority. Uh, or, um, sorry, major investor. Um, there's certain rights that are allocated for those people as well. Uh, that's that's that can be a real detriment to your business and can ham it can really hurt you from raising capital from potential investors because they look at the cap tail and they see that it's quite messy. So 
Keep that in mind with the with the vesting schedule, uh, with both hiring and working for startups. What's the cliff part? The, the as I said, the cliff is basically means that for that first year, um, I get nothing every month until the end of the year, and then I get that whole first year at once, and then there on for the next three years, I get I get a, uh, a a share of the stock options that I get each month at the end of each month. All right. Um, so, uh, with regards to what does it take to actually raise the capital? Um, so, thirty-second pitch. Um, uh, if we were in person, I would maybe do this exercise. But uh, one of the things I like to do is uh, like a thirty-second pitch exercise, and I'd encourage all of you to potentially come together and do this sometime with Gord. <laughs> all right. We don't have to go through it. It's all good. Uh, but yeah, so the 30 second pitch, uh, you, you say what your 30 second pitch is and then you get everybody to critique you on it and then you say it again and you say it again and you say it again until you get it more and more and more succinct, right? I should be able to get a really clear understanding of what your business is, where you're at and where you're going in 30 seconds, right? You got to hook me, right? As an investor, right? I'll be honest, I get hundreds of pitches a month, a month, right? Tons of people send me emails saying, hey, invest in this, invest in that. I get all kinds of stuff. I get folks because I have it on my LinkedIn, my email's on there. People send me all kinds of stuff, right? You got to hook me right away if you want to get my attention. Um, when you're building pitch decks and you're building presentation decks, right, build multiple options, right? Don't just build one version, right? For this pitch competition, I don't know what the rule on how much time you're going to have. Um, maybe it's three minutes or five minutes, but you should have varying lengths, right? You should also have what's called what a leave behind deck. So when you a, a best practice for presenting is to not have a ton of words on the screen, right? More infographics, right? Graphs, charts, and then you use your words to explain what's happening. Well, the thing is, is when I send somebody an email, they're not going to get the words part, right? So you need to take what you're going to say and you need to put it into the into the pitch deck so you can email it to somebody. They can read it over and get a full understanding of your business. So that's what's called a leave behind deck. Essentially, it's called a leave behind deck because the people would literally leave it behind. You'd go for a meeting with a VC and you say, all right, here's a leave behind deck so you can review it and share it with your partners because they will have to pitch it to other people. I don't invest alone, right? So say I see your pitch, I need to now then go and share it with everybody else. Hey, do you want to invest in this with me? And I need as much ammunition as possible to potentially share your deal. So give me that with a leave behind deck. When I, I also, I didn't put it on here. I encourage you, especially for those that are doing something that's maybe more technical, right? Or in a particular niche industry, that it might be hard to understand, you might want to have a version of the deck that has more information about that industry. So say you're in oil and gas or mining and you get into a meeting with someone and he's like, do you really understand the mining sector? Oh, no. Okay, let me, let me show you this version of the deck that has a little bit more information and background information about this sector that will help you better understand the market opportunity that is here for me uh, in, in building my business. Right. Um, this next one, the brevity is key, right? So something that often happens, uh, especially when you get into the actual meetings, right? The pitch decks and this just gets you in the room, right? So when you think about raising capital, you gotta think about it as sort of gateways that you need to get through, right? The first step is getting into that first meeting. After you get that first meeting, your, your next step is trying to get a second meeting, really. Right? You're trying to get a second meeting and you're trying to get them to want to go into your data room. And I'll, get, I'll explain that in a minute. But what often happens in that first meeting, I'll ask one question. I've had, literally had this happen before. I'll ask one question and I won't get a second question in for 20 minutes. Right? Because you just talk and talk, 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 talk. And I'm sure you could. I'm sure you could just ramble on and on about your business. You're excited. You're passionate. You love what you're trying to build. You're really amped up about it. But try to keep it like really tight because what you want in these meetings, you want them to ask in the 30 minutes, I should be asking you 20 to 30 questions, right? It should be just rapid fire. I just ask you question after question after question after question, 
right? And if you give me that time to ask you lots of questions, you'll find that, that you'll be more successful in getting that second meeting. So, yeah, there's a little tip. Um, data room. So when companies used to uh, do due diligence before, they would actually have a physical room that you would uh, go into and say if I was – you know, buying the Affinity Credit Union, I would go to Affinity Credit Union headquarters, there'd be a room with all the files in it. Well, now that's all done digitally. So Google Drive, DocSend, whatever it is, I uh, recommend using some sort of cloud service. Um, you organize all the documents that define your business. If you wanna know how to structure your data room, we have a really great series on our YouTube page all about this. We also have a checklist uh, that you can go through that really lays out all the things that you need to do uh, to have a really well-organized data room. Any questions on raising capital and pitching and all that? Um, I really like your idea. I think we're all set up a time in November for all of you guys to come down here, and we're just going to do that to each other. Over yeah. Over. I love it. Yeah, 30-second pitch practice, um, a lot of fun. Some of the top... Uh, accelerator programs and incubators actually every week, like on Fridays, they do uh, pitch practice. So every Friday you do a full three minute or five minute pitch uh, and you critique each other and then you do it again the next week and you do it again the next week. That might also be something that you folks would want to do uh, leading up to the competition. And it would be good to have people in who know nothing about what uh, is going on. Yeah. Because trying to be succinct. But yeah, I love it. All right. Um, so fundraising in general, um, when you're when you're thinking about it, um, what you really got to be thinking about is where do you want to be in three years, five years, ten years, right? And how much money do you need to get there, right? I know it's all going to be estimates. You're going to come up with projections. The projections are all going to be wrong. Uh, I guarantee they will be wrong. That's something that's, <laughs> that every an entrepreneur and every investor will know is that startup projections are always wrong. Um, but at least you should, you should do the exercise, right? You should spend the time doing the exercise. And when I say you're spending the time doing the exercise, I mean like going through the steps of, okay, what point do I need to hire somebody? Do I, do I think I need to hire somebody? At what point do I need to expand operations? Right, add another region, add more equipment, right? And you need to map, I would say, map it out for at least three years. Anything beyond five, right, is total bullshit, right? Because at that point, like, like so much can change, honestly, in, in three months, let alone three years, five years, right, when it comes to a startup. I've seen companies shift the entire, like, product market that they're in in three months, right? So, Yes, there are estimates, but you should at least have a plan on where you're going, what milestones you need to hit. Because as I mentioned earlier, what VCs want to see is sort of a 3x increase in value of your company between rounds of investment. So what you need to be thinking about is, how can I create three times more value in my company over probably a two to three year period? Right, because that's that's approximately the time length between rounds, especially right now, where we're in a little bit more of a capital uh, desert right now, where, where capital is a little harder to come by. Uh, it's about two to three years that it takes to to between uh, the rounds of capital. Uh, so you, that's what you got to think about. And yeah, uh, Gore here, he built a company in what's called bootstrapping. Right? Can you fund more of your company just off great cash flow? Right? Maybe you're you're able to to sell the product. Um, you don't have like and and sort of manage your accounts payable and accounts receivable in such a way that you don't need the capital, right? Um, and if you don't need it, that's great, right? Don't take my money. It's totally fine, right? I and this way you keep full ownership of your business, but you got to map it out. You got to think about where you're going to be, as I said, in three to five years. Um, yeah. So I put 12 to 18 month runway. I really should have put like 18 to 24 on there. Uh, it, it is. A lot longer than that. Um, something to keep in mind here is that yes, the VC VC funds raise in ten year cycles. Um, so they they raise a fund, and that fund actually de well deploys over about five years, has ten years to return uh, that money to investors. Um, so there's a cycle that happens. So when you meet with a VC fund, right? This is a little, little trick. Ask them, are you actively deploying right now? 
Because sometimes you'll meet with an investor that's just kicking the tires, and that's a waste of your time. So make sure that you're before you're having that meeting with the investor that you that you get a sense of what their ability is to actually write you a check, right? Um, and this is another thing too is if you're if you're thinking about like when you're actually going to get the check, like don't count it until it's in the bank. I've had I've had startups bank on oh yeah we're going to get the money by the end of the week. Three months later, money's still not in the account yet because it's taken. Investor, like parent died or something like that. Now they're busy and distracted, and then they had to go on vacation, and then da da da, da happened, and all of a sudden it's three months later, and, you're, and the money's still not in the bank account, right? So don't actually count it. So make sure you've got backup plans to your backup plans to be able to manage that, because until that money is in your bank account, it's that old you know gambler, you know, don't count your money while you're sitting at the table, right? Until it's actually in your account. Uh, it, it's not real. So um, account, account for those uh, potential roadblocks and risks there. Um, yeah, so market cycles as well. As I said, market's down right now, right? For anybody that was around and raising money a couple years ago, what they were saying is like, get lots of money right now and then weather the storm, right? So you need to have a sense of where the macro economy is at to have a good sense of whether or not going out and raising capital is uh, is appropriate for the for the time period that we're in. So with the time period that we're in, is it near to impossible to get money right now? No, it's it's. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a it's 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 hard. Um, what I'll say now is, so if we looked at 20, 2020 and twenty twenty one, those were the you know last couple of years of a ten year bull run on tech. Right. It was one of the, the biggest since about 2020 to, to 2021. Great, great years uh, for, for tech investing. Um, the, the issue was, especially in 2020 and 2021, is, it, is that com investors um, were basically saying growth at all costs. Right? All they cared about was growth. Are you growing quickly? Right? That was very quickly pivoted to can you grow profitably? Right. What that means is, is if I'm going out and acquire, and, and there's two key um, terms that come up with investors uh, that I haven't mentioned yet, which is customer acquisition cost and lifetime value. Right. So if you're going out and acquiring customers for say three dollars, and the lifetime value is only six dollars, it's not very good. Right. Cost like fifty percent. To get that much value, that's bad, right? It's bad mar. That's the bad margins, especially when you take into account all the other costs within your business. You're going to have a very tiny margin, especially on a software product. So what what they're looking at now, and what investors are looking at, is really what is that ratio between your customer acquisition costs and your lifetime value, and is it better than three to one, right? That's what they want to see. So if if you have those 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 what what's called great unit economics. Meaning, for every unit of 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 your thing that you sell, uh, you have a great margin on it. Uh, you're going to be able to raise capital, right? If you have a great pedigree as a founder, you have a really good uh, um, what's called founder problem fit. Meaning, you're the right founder to be solving this particular problem. You'll be able to raise capital, right? But if you're just like burning cash because you you're trying to build something crazy and huge. And you, and you don't have any sort of uh, way of creating uh, positive cash flow, in, especially in, in the event that something happens in the market cycle, right? Where you can maybe let go of a bunch of employees and really pull back and what and get to what's called default alive, meaning like in the event of something bad happening, you're not going to collapse, you're not going to go bankrupt. Um, then, uh, then, then you're more likely to raise capital, right? Because you have uh, those ability to be more nimble. Um, yeah. Any other questions about this? All right. I know I'm dumping like a ton of information on you guys, but I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, I had some exercises here that you wanted to go through. Um, I'm curious if, if any folks in the chat are going to jump in on this, but we'll give it a shot. Um, love for you to jump in, in the chat on these ones. Um, if not, me and, me and Gord will have some fun here. 
uh, doing it together. So I've, I've created some examples. These are, these are companies that I've worked with. Um, I've, I've used, or companies that I've worked with, I've used them to create these examples. Um, so um, essentially, I'm going to provide some uh, details about uh, the company and where they're at. And then I'd love for the folks here to maybe give their thoughts on what they would do as a founder to get some money into the company. So with that, uh, so 2SM means two-sided marketplace. Think Uber, Airbnb, right? Big, big potential for those companies. Um, so that's why they talk about scale massively. Uh, this company started before the pandemic. Um, so they had to, to go through the pandemic. They, uh, they're hiring staff from the university nearby. Uh, in order to build, build the business. And they're doing a lot of research and development, but they have a very chunky cash flow, right? They're not, they're not able to sort of have that, that smooth cash flow. What are their financial options? I would go for government grant. Yep. That's one option. Yeah, what kind of government grant? NRC. Mm -hmm. And what did it, what what bullet point on that gave you that one? Uh, university and research and development. Yeah, so this one in particular is is where the IRAP comes in. So IRAP's got a program uh, called Youth Program. Um, anybody under thirty, uh, university grad um, that uh, is hired by a company can uh, can you can get basically eighty percent of their salary funded by the government. So, yeah. Uh, anything else? What other grants? There's a few other. I got, there's like three or four options for financing here. Research and development is another reason. So I mentioned it, a uh, special type of financing earlier. Right. There you go. Yeah. So they're doing lots of research and development so they can get shred, but because of the chunky cash flow, um, they can't wait around for their shred claim to came back. So get some shred financing uh, to be able to weather the storm um, is, is really helpful uh, with um, the chunky cash flow. Yeah. Anything else? I don't know if I really mentioned this one before. My tax. No, we did not mention that. Okay, yeah. Um, so MyTax, M-I-T-A-C-S, um, is a really great program, especially for this second one here with the university. So if you're hiring recent grads, MyTax, um, like depending on the time of year, sometimes they have a program that's like a three-to-one match, but it's usually a one-to-one -one match. Um, so they'll, they'll pay about half the salary for, uh, I think it's up to six months. Uh, or two, six, I can't remember exactly what it is. You can check with the MyTax staff, uh, but they provide um, some great funding to be able to hire, as I said, recent grads, especially masters or, or actual folks that are working within the university. So if you're doing a lot of deep tech, deep technology work, um, using MyTax to get the staff from the university is a great financing option. Yeah, there's still one big one that you're missing too. Well, uh, I know I didn't really mention it, but the pandemic. So oh. there was a ton of free money around the pandemic. So if you did start before the pandemic, there's still some free money available for you. Um, I thought it was all like we had to pay back last December. No, there's uh, there's provincial money available for for marketing programs and things like that. If you um, were existing during the COVID. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So there's another good one. Uh, and then, of course, um, yeah, going out and raising capital, right? They're, they're, they're scaling massively, right? So a lot of options there for going out uh, and raising uh, venture capital. Like, and because IREP has another uh, fun to help just with that, not just with, so you have your educational stuff uh, or through, through your employment stuff, but they also have helps to get you through ceilings that you might be hitting with a ceiling uh, growth. Yeah, sorry. No worries. No, absolutely. Um, all right. Yeah. So company, they developed a moderately priced um, widget for the restaurant industry. Um, they, it's, a, it's a five, 
it costs five thousand dollars and it's got a five year warranty so it costs thousand dollars a year um, but it greatly reduces um, costs and increases performance so it pays back in less than a year um, it's the widget it's produced abroad so it's got a really long supply chain they got to worry about uh, making sure that they've got all of the equipment they need in order to produce this widget they've got all the different pieces and they often have to buy parts and pieces a year out in order to uh, make sure that they've got uh, enough to be able to produce for their their um, their inventory um, yeah because they need to be able to have a large inventory because what they're doing is they're they're testing the widget in a couple of different restaurants and if that one restaurant love it they sell it to the whole chain so they need to have a whole whack of these ready to go when all of a sudden they're going to have uh, potentially hundreds of orders for this widget all at once right uh, they're also leasing some of these widgets to the companies so instead of just selling them for 5k they're doing it as like a cash flow system what are their financial options this is absolutely a real company <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I would, uh, other than, I mean, the, everything we're going to say, I brought it to pretty much. But yeah. I would say, you, you know what? I forgot to mention on this one, there's actually is only one employee and uh, the founder is the only real employee. Everything is contracted out. Uh, so actually with this one, IRAP is not an option. Uh, yeah. Well, I would go for a line of credit. Yes. Yeah. Because you're, the widgets that you're buying do have value. That yeah. You could. So it's not like you're burning it on labor. Yeah, exactly. Line of credit here um, is a great option, or some sort of um, yeah, some sort of operating debt um, to be able to to manage your cash flow uh, is is a great way uh, to go about it as well. Uh, something, uh, a couple other things uh, to keep in mind too. There is um, funding uh, for economic, or sorry, for export uh, development, and there is like. Especially, for example, if you're making your product here and you're selling it into a country or market where you're worried about whether or not that person's going to pay you back, there is like insurance and stuff around it. So um, keep that in mind. The one issue here where they wouldn't be difficult for them to get is that they're producing this widget abroad, right? Um, but I didn't want to mention that on on this one. Yeah, so Sagashima is unique in that it has its own trade and export. Yes. Province, so that's, okay. Yeah, yeah, and um, and step Saskatchewan Trade and Export Partnership. Um, there's a lot of money there to to go to conferences and the like. Um, so for this one, for example, in the restaurant industry, a lot of sales conferences to go to. I would recommend uh, this company uh, and the founder to check out Step uh, for the opportunity to like get some funding to cover conference expenses and the like, um, because that's how you're going to get a lot of these contacts uh, for the restaurant industry. Um, so is this, did the guy do this and he's still just one person? Yeah. A lot of contractors. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> that's that's but, a good way to do it if you can. Yeah. And he's raised, uh, I'll say on this one too, had to raise a lot of private capital at first um, to get off the ground. So if you're building a hardware product, um, especially something like this where um, in, in this particular case with the actual product, there's, there was a ton of R&D that needed to happen. Uh, in order to actually build the thing and figure out a way to make it work, um, it was you know obviously an idea. It was literally an idea sketched on a napkin. Um, the founder showed us the napkin once, um, but the yeah. So the the issue here was is is that uh, there wasn't there a ton of there isn't a ton of funding uh, to be able to develop uh, that type of hard this type of hardware product. Um, it's not clean technology. It's not, you know, changing, you know, the potential uh, around climate change and all that. It's not uh, sort of impact focused. There's a lot of um, funding for that type of thing uh, from the federal government, um, but for this, there there isn't. So you got to raise a lot of private capital um, if you're building some sort of, you know, widget for a non sort of impact focused um, with the with the current, uh, you know, state of of availability of capital with grants and the like. Um, if you're not in one of those areas, it's going to be tough. So, with that, I'm kind of teeing you up with this next one. <laughs> I'm getting Facebook message questions, but it oh, yeah. makes sense, so we just keep going. No, no, please. <laughs> what do we got? Um, Anything? Uh, no, it's actually about tonight. Oh, okay. They want to talk to you more tonight. Okay, sweet. 
I will. I would yeah. love to teach everybody here. Okay. Um, and yeah, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm just Jesse Weeb. Find me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to chat. Um, so yeah, another great company here. Um, they developed a hardware product for the oil and gas sector. Um, it reduces the emissions um, and and really helps clean things up there. Um, that the founding team has that deep technology experience. They're they're uh, former university professors. Um, they really understand their stuff. Um, they've they've raised a bunch of money already, actually. Um, so uh, they they've got some some private capital already, and uh, they're doing some development on the technology to apply it to other to other verticals, in particular in the agri food and the agriculture space. They're able to reduce a ton of emissions in that space as well. So I gave you some hints from the last couple. What options are available for financial capital for this one? I forget the name of it, uh, but it was the, because uh, you know me with the words, um, where you uh, promise for the next round. Uh, like venture debt? Yeah. yeah. No, not venture. Well, okay, you could do Warrants. That. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's going to be venture debt here. Yeah. For your next round. Because really, that's what it's for, isn't it? To break down a ceiling. Um, well, there's one I was I mentioned earlier. Um uh, very briefly, but I didn't really like hit on it. SDTC, Sustainable Development Technology Canada, I want to say. Anything that's in the clean tech space, right? Um, they, they, they have sort of two pools of money. Uh, the, they, this company, because they've raised over $2 million, would be in the second pool, which is for companies that are scaling up. Um, there's a longer application process. I believe it's like a million plus that they'll be able to provide to you. Um, it's like free money. The other option for clean technology companies with SDTC, if you are raising, if you have raised $100,000 on a safe or as shares, they will not accept a convertible note. FYI. Convertible note. Yeah. So, okay. But uh, SDTC will not accept a convertible note as acceptable to apply um, for, for this. But if you have raised over $100,000, you can get a matching, like one to one matching. So SDTC will give you $100,000 of free money, right? You have to apply for it. Uh, and there's a whole vetting process. Um, at, then you you could get some some money there uh, to help develop. You could also use a convertible note. Could you not? Uh, no, with having, having raised a bunch of money already, um, there's a bunch of other options available. Yeah. There's, a, there's actually one I, I mentioned briefly. Um, Prairie Scan. So Prairie Scan, uh, in this case, especially when it's in of alignment with clean technology and others, they have a number of programs. I mentioned the zero interest loans. They've also got what's called a business scale-up program, uh, where essentially they can provide, I think it's somewhere between 500 and a million, um, depending on the company, it might even be a little more than that. They will provide um, essentially uh, reimbursement on expenses towards scaling up your business. Um, and so there can be all kinds of things that you can use it on. Um, Shred, obviously here, tons of deep technology experience. So highly recommend uh, looking to Shred uh, on this I'm one. a little off topic, but because I just said that, um, someone can't make it tonight, Keith. Um, so yeah, anyway, so he wants to reach out to you. So you'll have on your last slide your contact details? Uh, I didn't actually put it on the last one on this one, but yeah, I can. Okay, guys, we're getting off subject. We'll... Yeah, yeah, yeah. All good. All good. That was via text Um, yeah. So shred, shreds here. IRAP, MyTax. As I mentioned, they're doing a ton of work. They're they they they're, they they were former university professors, so they're hiring a lot of you know PhDs and master students. So yeah, MyTax, IRAP are really great programs here. Um, BDC as well is another really great option with this one with the hardware product, right? It does create a little easier on trying to get um, some sort of asset um, uh, with liability as opposed to personal liability. Um, so that, that would be another one that I would look into. Be, and RBCX um, is another option as well because, because they've raised a $2 million seed round. That, all that means that they're like further along right in the process so they have uh, they have a little more options so when you get when you get to that stage that's what, that's one of the things I that you should be thinking about all right 
<coughs> last one. <coughs> um, okay. Um, so yeah, pharmacist, pharmacist recently moved to the province and they want to start a tech enabled compounding pharmacy, meaning compounding pharmacy means that they, there's a very limited number of pharmacies that can do this, but basically it means creating a, like the creating the drug, like in the actual facility, uh, about 3% of, uh, pharmacies, um, or about 3% of drugs are compounds. Um, but I mean, uh, the drug market is massive, so that makes 3% actually a really big number. Um, and, uh, there's a limited number of pharmacies that can do it. Um, so in Saskatoon, for example, there's like only a couple. So if you, if you, your local one can't do it, you have to like drive all the way across town just to get your kids Tylenol or whatever. Um, so, uh, in this case, uh, they've got previous, uh, experience running a pharmacy. Um, they're, they're doing some R and D, uh, on the tech platform and they have some capital from the previous exit. What are their options? Sorry, if you have enough money from your past exit, you're going to want to reinvest that to something. And if that was from something you just created, trust yourself, man, and bootstrap. Absolutely. Right. So if you, and, and this is going to be case too, is like maybe you got family. So they did, yeah, there's a lot of shareholder loans. They bootstrapped. Um, they did something else though too. And I, one of the reasons I, I put this example in it because I had a feeling some folks down here might be creating more sort of traditional type businesses that might be tech enabled. And there's a, one of the great things about the more traditional businesses is there's a particular type of capital that you get access to that's very hard for most tech startups to get access to. Any guess? Full transition fund? Yeah. <laughs> Debt financing, just straight up debt financing, going to a bank. Banks will finance pharmacies. Banks will finance most traditional businesses, right? They will go, they will finance them, especially if you've got experience, right? They've done it before, right? They have some capital already of their own. If you're starting from this position where you have experience in that industry, you're doing a tech enabled, more traditional business. Yeah, banks, banks will give you money, right? So. Something to keep in mind. Uh, and then I mentioned my tax again earlier, right? This is this is a great one for my tax and IRAP. Uh, again, um, doing the R&D uh, and then yeah, potentially getting some shred uh, or shred financing if you need to help manage your cash flow. Um, yeah, um, as again, they they actually also raise they raise some private capital as well. Uh, so you may be wondering, well, you've got all this you know capital. Well, why would they want to raise private capital? Well. They're doing something new. They're doing something different. They're doing the tech-enabled part. They wanted folks that understood that part on their team, right? So often, you know, folks will say, oh, well, the only reason you're raising capital is because you need the money. That's not the only reason you raise capital, right? Sometimes the reason you raise capital is because you need the strategic value of those investors on your team. They can open doors. They can make connections for you. They can help you avoid problems that you didn't know were going to be there, right? I often use this analogy. In an ideal world, the interaction between a great founder and investors is a plus sign, right? Positive. Everybody better off. The, the founder is the vertical, meaning you have to understand your industry really, really well, right? I want you to be the expert on the industry that you're in. I want you to know it inside and out, everything there is to know about that industry. <laughs> you need to know. My job as the investor is to help you see everything across, right? I help you take learnings from other companies that I've worked with and bring them to your company. I help you avoid some of those macroeconomic things. Hey, by the way, this thing is happening in the macro climate. Are we prepared for that, right? So that's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, essentially, my, my job is like at the intersection to keep you from getting sideswiped by the garbage truck, right? So, so you don't crash and burn. So, yeah, that's that's something to keep in mind uh, there as well. So, that's where the term smart money, yeah, and dumb money comes from. You way prefer smart money. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, that was the last one. I didn't put a end slide on. I should have put an end slide on. But yeah, that was my last um, example. Um, 
No questions yet? Any questions? All right. So, yeah, let's go through some finer points of pitching. So now that you guys understand what your options are for getting capital, uh, let's talk about one of the key, key processes of getting it. And honestly, one of the key exercises as a founder that you have to do uh, in order to build your company, which is perfect your pitch. So before we kind of get into these rules, actually, I want to talk a bit about why it's important to pitch, right? Um, pitching forces you to simplify what you're trying to do and, and explain it to people uh, in a way that makes it really easy to understand, right? Talking about, you know, explaining like complex points uh, in a succinct way uh, so that um, folks understand and can relate to what you're trying to accomplish. So you can hire staff, so you can uh, find the customers, right? If you can't explain what it is that you've built and sell it and sell it to somebody, um, well, you're never, you're not going to have a, you're not going to have a business, right? You can't build it without clients, without customers. Um, so the, the process of pitching, well, it can seem frustrating at times, right? It can seem a little pointless. I'm just going on stage, giving this presentation. What does that accomplish, right? What it does is it forces you through an exercise where you have to learn a lot of different aspects of your business and be able to take all those different aspects and distill it down into a very concrete and, and, and simple way of explaining it. Um, yeah, so when, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you got to keep it simple when it comes to uh, your pitch. Um, try to follow some sort of outline or a logical flow. If you're jumping, like, think about it as a story, right? If I jumped around in a story, like if you were reading a book and like all of a sudden went from chapter one to chapter four, five to chapter three to chapter seven to chapter 15 to chapter two right if it did if that was the way the book was like laid out when you were reading it you would get super confused all of a sudden you're you're at a totally different point in the story right so really got to think about that is that your pitch right or any time that you're talking to someone you're telling a story right and it's got to have a beginning a middle and an end right like uh, a, a flow to it, right? This one too, right? When it comes to a pitch or anytime you're talking to people or pitching your business, you don't have to have a deck in order to pitch your business. It can literally just happen in a conversation during, during a meeting. Like know what not to say, right? Honestly, what, like knowing what not to say is almost better than knowing what to say, right? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, I've had founders that have talked for 20 minutes after one question, right? They shared too much information, right? <laughs> so you need to be ruthless. And, and also to bear in mind, too, we'll get into this in, in, in a little bit here. Um, the point of the pitch deck isn't to explain all the aspects of your business, right? I understand as a founder, you have this grandiose vision. You want to build this big massive company you can you can i can sell it in this industry and then i can also do it in this industry in this industry and i can do all these different things with this product you know you know in year 10 we're going to do this and we're going to do that that's great right that should probably be like one slide right be like down the road we're going to do a couple things right boom done that's all you have to say about that right and try to make sure that you're uh, you're not getting too complicated another important one three point rule each slide Right, we've got the rule of three. Most people easily remember three things if you list them off, right? So try not to uh, to do too many more items. Um, yeah, <clears throat> a lot of folks like to put on tons of numbers. I've seen some very, very uh, overwhelming like forecast slides or you know sales metric slides with like tons of numbers on them. I just get lost, right? And now I'm not. And now I'm trying to figure out what's on the screen, and I'm not listening to you anymore. So that's also something to keep in mind with any slide, right? And then, yeah, jargon, right? You're in your industry, you understand what I mean. But if I say like the CIC, that means like five different things in five different industries, right? So like make sure 
you don't use acronyms. Make sure you don't use jargon. Try to explain it in the uh, the most uh, simple way possible. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I mentioned this earlier, right? Like, you know all this stuff. This, this, I'm going to learn this in conversations with you after. This is to get me in, interested in figuring out what's here, right? So that's, that's the whole point of that top part. Um, yeah, um, something to keep in mind too here is that uh, this is hard. Lots of people have to do it. It takes a long time. You probably aren't going to figure out. You're going to have to like do, as I mentioned, like do that practice over and over and over again before all of a sudden you're, it's all of a sudden you're going to find this one. Like, oh, that's how I need to explain it. Right. That's the analogy. Right. That's why you practice over and over again. So you can find those little moments where you're like, that's the easy way to explain it to somebody. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, tell a story, have a beginning, middle and end. So, Yes, the format, the sort of high level, how you should organize a pitch deck, hearts, minds, wallets. I mentioned what that is earlier, so we'll get into it. So this is a great flow for a pitch deck. I think that ends up being, yeah, 12, 12 slides, right? So a 12 slide deck is about the, the, the sort of industry standard for a deck. You have these 12 slides. One thing I'll mention is that sometimes this slide can go up here, right? It's in black because it, it, it often the team slide, especially in certain situations, can be the core of your heart strategy, right? Maybe there's an emotional tie-in, right? We have a company, for example, uh, in Saskatoon called Cadence. They help people uh, navigate what happens after they, uh, they lose a family member, how about all the estate settlement, the whole software solution for it. The reason why they're doing that is because the founder lost their mother uh, and they had to go through that whole situation themselves. That's why they built the company. That's why they put the team slide right up at the top because it grabs you that heart string right out of the gate, right? And they've got, they've got the experience, they understand the industry, right? And they've got, they've got other people on their team that really knock it out of the park that gets me excited if you've got this really great team, right? If you have like tons of experience on your team, put it at the top, right? Because it's gonna make me super excited and it's gonna hook me for the rest of it, right? Uh, so we're gonna get into kind of all these different sections here in a minute, um, but that gives you a good idea sort of on the high level outline. Um, and this gives you an idea sort of what is the core question that you are answering on each slide. So each slide, when, whenever you have a slide, the same way you'd have a chapter in a book, there has to be a purpose behind it, right? Each chapter, which, you know, for anybody who's taking English or any sort of writing class, right? Every chapter, every paragraph in an essay, every has a beginning, middle, and an end of its own, right? And it has, and it's in service usually of answering some sort of question or getting some sort of point across, right? A, a chapter in a book is, is is trying to tell a particular story in that um, short period of time. So. As I mentioned in the introduction, you're trying to hook me right out of the gate, right? Problem, you're really getting into the the, the pain that I'm trying to solve, uh, and 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 then uh, how you're taking it away, or are you taking it away? Um, and uh, yeah, market. Well, what's that? What's that business environment, right? Who else is involved in that in that marketplace, right? What and what's your differences to those companies, right? Who else is doing it? Show me. Don't tell me, right? Often, what's great on on the competitive difference slide, we'll get into. I think uh, it talks a little bit later on, um, is uh, uh, sort of a matrix or uh, some sort of uh, some sort of graph that really shows where you are, where the competitors are. Uh, or do you have a technological advantage? Right? Do you have some intellectual property that uh, get into that? That's this is sort of the minds part there in the middle. Uh, how are you approaching the market? How are you selling? How are you selling this thing, right? That's the approach to market. Revenue model, how are you making money, right? How is that money flowing into your business? Uh, forecast, I'm interested in knowing where are you going? How are you, and then milestones, but what, is, what, what are we gonna do together? And, and how are you gonna achieve? The, and what are those milestones that you're gonna achieve that are gonna get to me when you're gonna ask me for money at the very end that are gonna get me excited for, oh, if you hit these things, we're gonna make a ton of money. Right. And then, uh, of course, as I mentioned, 
team teams really telling me is can you execute right and honestly this is probably one of the most important things in the whole process of pitching is who are you and can you execute um so yeah if you if you've got like very little time this is something to think about uh in terms of what you're trying to get across um we're gonna have 15 to 20. yeah so you have lots of time to get through. You'll be able to get through. You but you basically have a, a 15 to 20 minutes. You got a minute per slide. That's a lot of time. Um, but yeah, if you're trying to get the, the like the point across quickly, what I want to know most, like after you've kind of explained the basics of like problem you're solving, what market you're in, da, 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 is like, are you doing it? Like, have you found traction? Have you validated this idea in any way, shape, or form with anybody that's actually showing me that this thing is actually have legs, right? So that's what this, that's, this is what gets anybody excited. If you're talking to someone for like 30 seconds, right? And you, and you can get this point across, right? And we've, we've sold the product into 80 A&W locations already. Oh, wow. Okay. That's really exciting. Like we should talk, right? Okay. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Here's a great question. <laughs> yeah it's about 30 seconds yeah so this by the way is is means like at 30 seconds that's about the maximum time you should be spending on one slide right in a, in a typical like quick paced pitch 30 seconds right if you're spending more than 30 seconds on a slide you need to be thinking about either adding another slide that gets more across, right, and breaking it up into two slides, or finding a way to get your point across quicker uh, for that one particular slide. Um, yeah, so I mentioned the elevator pitch. Essentially, what you're what what you're trying to get across is why should I actually pay attention to your business? Why should I take the time, right? Um, and so I mentioned earlier, right, like getting to that traction. This is a really quick and easy. So you guys are talking about your 30 second pitch. Here's sort of a template. I can send this deck to, uh, to Gord afterwards as well. Um, so you can share it with everybody. Um, but yeah, this is uh, sort of a great template. Um, uh, you could read for, it into two. Like you might want to say, I'm Gord with IDS, and we already have Philip Morris as a customer. Like, so move that traction up. Too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like if you've got like a big early customer or like we're, we have a pilot project with the University of Saskatchewan, right? Whoa, that's exciting. Like, oh, cow, that's a big logo. You know, that's exciting. Um, be careful too when you use though, when you use those logos. Um, if, if you don't have buy-in from like high level decision makers in an organization and you claim them, and I then call that organization. This has happened, for example, right? Where someone will be like, I have connections in a NEO. Well, guess what? We know the CEO of NEO. We will find out if you actually have those connections or not. So we'll be very careful about uh, what logos you drop and that it'll hold up to scrutiny. Because honestly, anything you say here or any point in the due diligence or any of the pitch, they will check. Eventually someone will check, right? So just like, and like, like often founders, um, Especially with software solutions, they'll they'll talk about a big company when really it's just like one employee in one office somewhere is using your software, and they'll claim the whole company is on board. That's that's a bit of a bit of a lie, not not really, but at the same time, it is kind of obfuscating the truth a little bit. Um, that doesn't go over well with investors. You're going to get yourself into trouble with that one. Um, yeah, I think we've mentioned this a few times, stories and all that there. So. Um, yeah, getting into the problem side. Um, really, what you're what you're talking about here um, is that uh, is that you understand is the customer's pain, right? Um, and that and that the pain that you're trying to talk about, um, at least for the people in that industry, sometimes you know, like folks, you know, often what we see for pitches, especially with like direct customers, like everybody knows what it's like to like have problems with their car, right? And like something like that, it's like, okay, yeah, customer's pain, we all, we all experience that. That can be very relatable. That can often be something uh, that's good to start with for the direct-to-consumers product is sort of like, 
who here in the room has experienced this? Especially if you know like 90% of the room is going to like, who's a parent and has a difficulty getting their kids to, uh, to an event, right? Well, we've got Uber for kids. That's an actual company, by the way. That's just, that, that TNT has in Saskatoon. So those, those types of exam, like using something like that is a great way to get people's attention, get them engaged, get them hooked. Then they're, then they're following you uh, right from the beginning. Um, thinking here, um, especially this one, right, with the problem, I have, like, when, you, when you're thinking about your business and what you're trying to solve, the, the pain has to be felt deeply, right, to the point where they want a Tylenol or an Advil to kill it, right? If it's not felt deeply enough, right, it's more of a vitamin, right? So in, 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 um, in the startup world, in the venture capital, we have to talk about uh, vitamins versus painkillers, right? So vitamins solve a pain, right? Uh, it's just very minor and often so long-term that we don't think about it, right? Because like, if I don't take my vitamins today, I don't suddenly have a problem. But if I don't take Tylenol when I have a headache, it really, really sucks, right? It hurts a lot. I'm very uncomfortable. I can't do any work, right? That's a problem, right? So I really want to take that Tylenol, right? So that's what you have to think about is, is like, do you understand how deep that pain goes, right? That's, that, that first point is, is, is honestly one of the most important. You can probably ignore the rest of it if, if you really get that. If you understand this point, the rest of it uh, will come together. Um... Yeah, I'll just keep moving along because I know we got a decent amount to get through here. Um, yeah, a couple key points uh, to uh, um, avoid, right? This happens a lot, right, where you think you've, you've figured out some sort of solution and you're looking for a problem, especially folks in academia, right, where you've developed some sort of new, te new technology and you're trying to find an application for it. Do this first. Figure out a problem, find a solution, right? It, as a founder, that's your job, right? And then when is it worth solving? Like, how big is it? We'll get to that in the market size. Uh, sorry, I have some water. <laughs> sorry, doing a lot of talking. Um, but yeah, like if, if the if the it's not like in a big enough problem, right? Um, it's not going to be worth solving at all. And um, to, that, to that first comment here um, about the assumptions, right? Unless you've got like deep domain expertise on that industry, I want to know you've done some sort of validation that this is a real problem. Like if you've got 15 years of experience in immigration and you're telling me you've got a solution for immigration, I believe you. Like there's a problem in it. I believe that you understand that, right? But if you're fresh out of university and you're starting a business and you tell me that you think there's a problem, this massive problem, right? But you've done nothing to actually prove you haven't talked to anybody yet. You haven't talked to consumers. You just think that's the case. I'm not going to believe you. Hmm. All right. Um, yeah. A few other key uh, options or uh, key things to avoid there as well. Um, so uh, thinking back, so this is actually an example here from one of Airbnb's early slide decks um, that uh, shows um, their problem slide. Super simple. Get it across. So that's, that's how simple it can be for a problem slide. That's actually really good because um, sometimes people will say, like, uh, I don't, for example, didn't have a problem. It made you think there was a problem. But if you think about it, and, and I, you could say the same thing about Airbnb, but in truth, no, they actually did have problems that they resolved. Yeah. Well, you, you have to, you have to, like, sometimes the problem isn't easily apparent, right? Because you're, you are creating. Yeah, and, and that you're, yeah, exactly. It's become so normalized um, in the world already um, that, it, that it becomes difficult uh, for people to really identify as a problem. Often, you know, like, uh, like Airbnb, like you're, you're competing against some very traditional systems and processes, like hotels have been around since like 
the dawn of civilization. So you're really going against something that's really been a normal thing um, for a long time. There's there's like plenty of companies. I know that like there there's one in Sestian that are literally competing against pen and paper. Like that's their, solution, their tech solution. Like that's the other thing that they're competing against is normal sort of the people just writing it down on pen and paper as opposed to putting it into an app uh, on their phone. So sometimes when when the what you're overcoming uh, can seem a little less than obvious. Um, yeah. So solutions, obviously, as we talked about, pain. Are you taking it away? Um, yeah. So here's. Here's the important part, right? Is that you're going to be outcome driven versus like it's about the product. The product is getting you to the outcome. It's not the product itself. That that's uh, that's the solution, right? That your your solution is 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 a fit for that problem, right? And I I need to be able to see that uh, on the solution slide, right? And you should be um, you're either solving a pain or you're somehow creating a net positive gain for my business. That's the other uh, potential thing you're doing, right? Like if, you, if you've if you got some sort of widget that's going to make me a bunch more money, right, that's also solving a pain, right? Making money is hard, right? <laughs> if you can make me more money, I will absolutely buy your business or buy your product. Um, yeah, something to think about here too. Like I've often seen examples of this uh, used as a problem and solution side. Like Dave's a homeowner; he has a hard time dealing with the maintenance of his house. Enter Omni; they help you manage your home. Right? That's one of our uh, one of our companies, our portfolio. That's basically how his like one of his pitches has gone. Is, is they usually literally use an example of a customer and sort of show how that customer's journey is benefited by their product, right? Knowing that as an investor, really personalize it. As I said, getting back, this is in the heart section, right? You're getting that emotional side. Of it. If you've got those emotional tie-in stories, right? Use those, use those, use those emotional tie-ins. Uh, one thing I'll mention here too, right? Is there an urgency to your solution, right? Is it something that someone just like has to buy as quickly as possible? That's really exciting. If you do have that, um, I'd love to see it. Um, yeah, if you can't understand, if you can't get the person to understand your solution, they're just not going to invest in it, right? You know, I have I have seen so many times where I get a pitch deck or see a pitch where, and this has happened multiple times. We'll get into a meeting with a bunch of investors. Does anybody actually know what this company does? No, I don't get it. Right? If you if you if I come out of your pitch and I don't know what your company does or what it is that you're solving or what it is that you've built, right? You got a problem, right? Because the whole rest of it is now like, woof, going over my head because everything kind of comes off of that. So you really need to make sure, right? Um, and and you know, as I said, like this is often where people go wrong is they use too much. Is that's where it goes over people's heads. They're using that jargon on the solution side. It makes it very hard for me to understand it. Right. Um, also here too is like the technology behind your solution is not your solution. Right. Explain that later. I want to know in the simplest possible terms, how, how are you solving the problem differently than everybody else? Why uh, or what it is that you're solving specifically, right? You're going to get into the kind of the, the nitty gritty of the how in the next few slides. So you don't need to get it. So make sure you're, you're focused on, on that. Oh yeah. Yeah. This is a great, like, don't, <laughs> the, we're making the world a better place, stuff like that, using a lot of cliches, don't try to, don't say that. These are all things to avoid. Yeah. Oh, tons of people love it. Apple can get away with it because they're huge, right? But, <laughs> um, yeah, and then this, this big one here too, uh, one of the things I'll mention um, is really important as a founder is, um, Strong, like strong opinions held loosely. Meaning, you have to have deep conviction on it is what you're doing, but you also have to acknowledge that over time, as you fall in love with your customer problem and solving it, what you think the solution is will probably change. So, if you're too tied in on your solution early on, right, 
you're not going to actually solve your problem. And what you're going to find is you're not going to build a successful business because at the end of the day, these people determine whether or not your business is successful, right? This is where it's like, what does the market decide? Or like when they say the customer is always right, it doesn't actually mean that they're right in the sense that you should always do what they tell you to do. What it means is if they're telling you that they want you to solve the problem this way, as opposed to the way you're currently solving it, like in a different way than the way you're currently solving it, listen to them, do that, solve it in a different way. So yeah, here's a really good little example of the Airbnb solution side. So I mentioned rule of three, boom, boom, boom. Infographics, nice and quick and easy, short words, right? It's quick, and easy. like look, there's probably what, like 15, 20 words on that slide, right? Very little. That's the way you should do it. Nice and clean and simple. Um, yeah, this was, uh, I think, an old LinkedIn slide deck, right? So this is a, this is a bad example. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's getting there. But this, I mean, this could, this could work. But I'll just say one thing that this could work for, not for a live pitch, but this can work for a leave behind deck. All right, like if I was doing a leave behind deck, I would put a slide in like this because this helps get some points across in a leave behind deck, but I wouldn't put this in a, in a, in a pitch deck. All right. Yeah, you know, a little quiz question. What's the cause of most startups failure? See if anybody knows. Do, 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 do. Yeah, you know, like, can I do the Jeopardy? Hey, Steve, I see you on there. Help me out. There's a few people online, I think, right? Oh, yeah, there, there. Nobody? And don't text me. <laughs> <laughs> no? Oh, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Lack of funds. No. Oh. No market need. Oh, no. Cash. Cash is up there. But market need uh, is even a bigger one. Right. So I mentioned earlier falling in love with your customer's problem, right? You you need to have that, that market pull, right? And on top of that, you need to have an understanding of why your solution is gonna work now, right? A lot of things have been tried before and often failed, right? Why this now? If you look at a company like Airbnb or Uber, one of the reasons why now it worked is the invention of the iPhone, right? By having the iPhone, it now made it possible to way faster communication between the host and the guest it allowed, uh, we also had technology develop around remote access, like uh, key, um, uh, door code keys, lock boxes, things like that, um, that made it easier for you to be able to do that. So what are those trends that are happening in the market? A company like Omni, uh, which was a recent winner for Startup TNT, one of the reasons why they talk about the market is millennials are starting to buy more homes and millennials suck at home maintenance. Right, so that's why Omni is going to fill that gap in home maintenance, is because the millennials are changing the market. So that's those are the things you got to be thinking about when you're thinking about market, right? What are the are, is there is there a regulatory change that has happened recently, right? There are certain companies uh, like immigration, for example. When we we were invested in a company in the immigration space, uh, they let us know that uh, the the amount of uh, immigrants that were going to be allowed for a company was going up from 10 to 30 percent. Well, that's huge. That's a massive jump in the market. That's really exciting. That makes this opportunity for investment even better, right? Um, and is and this is important too. What are the competitive forces that are out there? Is there something happening with the incumbents? Do you understand how those are working? Um, yeah. So this is often what happens to uh, people with the market slide. Uh, there's there's something called TAM. SAM and SOM. So what that means is total addressable market, serviceable addressable market, and serviceable attainable market. It's very complicated, but basically it means is how big is the overall market? With my solution, how, uh, how much of that can I possibly grab uh, overall, like sort of as a big number, and then how much within sort of a two to three year time frame could I possibly obtain? Right, that's that last small number. What I really want to know is that last small number for now, but I do want to have a decent size of the size of the market. And here's where people get it wrong, is that, is a, like for example, with Omni, they could say the total addressable market is 
all the money that's spent on home maintenance in North America, right? That's like a trillion dollar industry. I don't give a shit about that. That's a wait. That's an irrelevant number. It sounds really big. It's exciting, woo, but it really tells me nothing. What I really want to know is the is the market size that actually affects Omni. So in Omni's case, how much do millennials spend on home maintenance across North America? Right, that's the size of the market. Uh, in their case, it's still really, really big, right? Which makes me excited about the opportunity. So this is a really key one to to understand. Um, and here's also something too with the market size too is that is that you should also do what's called top down and bottom up, right? So top down is is what I'm talking about is like overall size of the market and you're trying to work your way down. Bottom up is like how many customers do you think are going to possibly um, buy this technology and work your way up from the bottom, right? From the number of customers that you have and customer behavior. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything else on this one. Yeah, something to keep in mind too, the overly optimistic. Um, we've, we've had presenters present on this before. If you were to look at Airbnb and what they identified as their total addressable market, how much do you think they've captured of that market since they first started? Now that they're a multi-billion dollar company on the stock market. Less than 4%. Right? So saying something like this, right? You're gonna capture 10% is insane. Even the biggest companies have captured less than four of of the what they've anticipated hearing. So that's also why the market has to be so big for a scalable company, is because even the really, 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 really big ones have still only captured a fraction of it. So, if you, so the market has to be absolutely massive in order for you to capture um, a market size, right? So this is this is the uh, the market sizing for Airbnb. As I mentioned, they've only captured like a very small fraction of uh, of the overall trips parked worldwide still, right? All right. Um, This one. I feel like the answer is pretty good. I think the answer is always. Throw one out. What do you think? I think B, video surgeon, is cheaper. Um, and I think the reason why is because they have a competition. This one. I hate this one. I hate it so much. You always have competition. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes your competition is legacy things, pen and paper. Right. Never say you have no competition. Right. One thing, like when I ran a ski resort, we, uh, for example, we would actually go look at Palladium, like Arcade, because that is people, that same money is going to skiing or to that. So that's a good example. Yes. Sorry. No, absolutely. That is a great example, right? Yeah. You, you got to be thinking about, you know, what is your customer making a decision between with a limited budget? Right, it's essentially what Gord just said there. Is there? There's always a competition. Sometimes it's direct, right? Uber, Lyft, direct competition, right? They're literally in the exact same market, right? Indirect competition, though, as I mentioned, it's some sort of substitute or alternative, right? It's near. It's the it's the near market, um, and you need to understand what differentiates you between those people. And and honestly, if if you at any point if you say you have no competition, all I assume is you you've done no research, right? And and I've and I've honestly I've seen this too from companies who's like, oh, I got no competition. It's like I know of four competitors in Western Canada that are trying to solve the same problem as you, let alone across North America. So often, and that's the other thing too is that we see is because we see so many pitches. Like you might not know about competition, but I, but there's, you almost always have to assume that there's somebody in a garage doing the exact same idea that you are and might be doing it better than you. And if you assume that all the time, you will always be able to talk about what makes you better because even like the person in the garage, you have a good idea of why you're going to beat them because maybe you've got the better team, right? Sometimes that's your competitive difference. We have people that are, that are deeply experienced and we're smaller and we're more nimble and we're gonna figure it out quicker than, than the big incumbent, right? That can be your competitive difference sometimes. In mentoring, someone actually brought up a good example of this and uh, we're actually online right now, so we know. Um, that if you think you can't find a competitor, so dig deeper, 
because their mistake is that they haven't got out there in a way. So far, learn from their mistake. What did they not do? Are they just the typical guy with an engineering idea, like you just said, in the garage that has no clue about marketing? So then, they, you know, your strength is it could be in marketing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, know, know your strength. And, th and this is also to hear, like, this is important, right? It's a real um, mood killer. If at some point, if you start bad mouthing your competition, right. And just talking shit about them. Um, doesn't, it doesn't come across very nice. seems like you're very vindictive. Um, yeah. So just really try to, to talk about and focus on why you're better. Um, yeah, we mentioned this array, no, the no competition. Um, yeah, this was another one too. It's like your only competition is a giant, right? That's often not true. As we mentioned, there's people, um, uh, that, uh, are working on these things all the time. Um, yeah. And here's two, like, if you're going to do like some sort of feature set comparison on your product between the companies, like make sure you really understand the feature set and don't just put on, like, I've seen these, all these other ones too, where they like show all these check boxes, but they're on like nothing features. Like, like we have a better login page. It's like, who cares? They can build that in two minutes, right? If you're going to put feature sets and put differentiator, they, the features actually have to be different and like significant, right? You have to you have to be sharing something with me that actually really sets you apart, and that's going to be hard to replicate, right? If your competitor can just notice it on your website or notice it on your technology and copy it because software isn't very patentable or protectable, they can figure it out, right? Look at Netflix now. All of a sudden, there's there's Disney Plus, there's Amazon Prime, there's all these different ones that like the streaming part wasn't protectable. Right, where they get the protection on Netflix is from all the content. That's why they're spending so much money on it. Right, so that's where you really have to be thinking about what are the real key differentiators and making sure that you're not um, uh, selling or, or saying a differentiator is on something that's really simple and easy to replicate. So here is the example uh, that Airbnb used. Um, this one, by the way, falls off really fast. <laughs> right. Like you might be first, but it doesn't take very long. And now we got like VRBO, for example, that's like eating Airbnb's lunch a little bit. And I would say from personal not actually No, absolutely not. Because you have to educate the market that you but, but your services. Are. Actually, sometimes the competitive advantage is the opposite, last to market. Yeah, there's something called the last mover's advantage, right? Which means with the last mover's advantage is that you get to look at everybody, everybody else has done and not make the same mistakes that they made. Right, that's last mover's advantage. Um, yeah, so some of these things, is like easy use, whatever, like over time, they would become uh, more um, uh, or, or less of a competitive advantage potentially. Um, yeah, so these graphs can be pretty tricky. You have to be careful um, like on what you're sort of setting as these graphs because the other thing too is like at the end of the day, like Audi or whoever, like if this is if this is the company you're pitching, you're telling me like this is going to be the best spot because it should be the best spot up and to the right is where everybody always wants to be, right? So if you're saying like Porsche is the best, they're the classiest and they're the, the sporty, and that's what we want, that's what you're pitching on, right? And like this isn't really like tell me that much about like what makes you so much better than your competitors. It's just giving me very limited information. And at the end of the day, I know you think you're the best. So tell me why you think you're the best, not just that you are the best, right? So yeah, this is another one that I was talking about with these like checkbox ones where you're looking about the competitors. This one's <laughs> particularly bad because <laughs> it's just overly complicated. I can't, just looking at it, I have no idea like what it actually means and how you may, how much better you are. And then here, right? <laughs> one of the things too is like, why is this one even on the table if they don't check any of the boxes? Just get rid of it, All right? And you have to be thinking about like what the the check marks is that you're that you're that you're doing here, right? And if you are actually able to uh, to truly differentiate across them, as I mentioned earlier, or that these feature sets aren't like simply uh, something that are so you like 
like you have three in common with everybody else. There's only one thing that's making you that much better. That's like, that's not great. You're not really showing me a great competitive difference. Um, and then the competitor really gets into the technology as well. Um, like what have you developed? What sets you apart? Um, is this going to be easy to copy or, or recreate? Um, when you, and something to keep in mind when you're getting into the technology side, especially for those folks that are more academic, um, you've been trained in academia to really like dive in and explain all that stuff. Ignore all that training. <laughs> you need to tell me at a really high level what it is that you've built, how you've built it, and I should be able to understand it in less than 30 seconds, right, when it comes to the technology spark, right? When it, so you got to explain it to me, like, explain it to me like I'm five, right? Like, Einstein talks about this. It's like, if you don't understand something well enough to explain it to a five-year-old, you, you don't actually understand it. So you should be able to, uh, to explain this concept um, very clearly and succinctly. Um, yeah. Um, there's something here, too. Um, to keep in mind um, around the technology, uh, are there more feature sets that you can add to it? Or is there, is there a roadmap for future development of the technology? Um, are there other segments that this could be applied to? That's something that I want to know. Uh, and I also in particular want to know on this last one, especially for companies in the hardware space um, that have developed more deeper technologies coming out of university research. I want to know, is it patented, right? Are you doing it as a trade secret? If, if so, you know, make sure, also make sure too, like with the patent stuff that like you're, you've got that buttoned up before you start pitching it because there are some rules about it. If you start revealing too much information to the public, you can't patent it afterwards, right? Or if you sell it to somebody before you've, you've, you've uh, um, fully patented it, you can run into all kinds of trouble there. So be careful about that. Get a good lawyer, um, uh, good patent lawyer before you dive into that. If you want to find a good patent lawyer, I recommend the folks at Good Lawyer. Um, they're out of Calgary. They have uh, a lot of connections. Joe Gill doesn't do patent law. He does all the startup stuff. But if you need to find a good patent lawyer, uh, check out Good Lawyer. Um, so, um, yeah, this is, we've talked about this a few times, getting into the jargon. Um, these, like, yeah, these are very subjective I want to really understand um, what makes it better without you just saying that it's cool, it's easy to use. Um, it, those are obvious. It should be easy to use. If it's not, then why are you, you know, selling it to people? Mm. Yeah, and then I mentioned there too. Um, be careful what you're sharing publicly. So this is the, yeah, I think it's the Airbnb technology slide. So super simple, rule of three, nice and clean. This one, on the other hand, terrible. Absolutely awful. Like, I don't even know, like, what you're trying to get across here with something like this. I don't even know what this is. Some sort of. All right, so approach to market. Um, this is a, an important, really important, which is, like, how are you actually going to find and get your customers? That's what the approach to market is. Um, what you're trying to do here is really show us that you've uh, got some sort of validation on your ability to go out and get customers in your target market, right? Um, if you've um, only just getting started, if you've even, even had this, this might be more of a, a guess or um, this is like what we're going to try or experiment with out of the gate. Um, that's okay, right? You can talk about that. That's fine. Um, but you should have some sort of, of evidence um, that shows that your hypothesis of how you're going to reach those customers is, is likely to work, right? There's got to be a reason why you picked that method over other methods. And I think it'll talk about this with broad strokes marketing. It's really bad. I hate when people say, oh, we're, we're going to spend a bunch more money on marketing. Okay, what do you mean? What channels are you using? Why are you using those channels, right? So if, you, if you're saying, we, like, you, we think we're going to use TikTok, right, to sell our product, you got to tell me X, Y, Z reason why TikTok is the best platform to reach your customers. You should have done the research on why that is the platform for you, right? Um, yeah, and you can have some sort of evidence of this already. A really great one, 
right, for a lot of folks on the approach to market, even the email signups, right? If you can, like, I actually just heard this one the other day um, on, a pod, on one of my favorite podcasts. Uh, a VC of the Valley said one of the first things you would do is run ads for the product that had, like, sign up for a potential presale or something like that. Sign up for the waiting list. And you send somebody to a waiting page and you get them to fill it out. If they've clicked on an ad and then they filled in that email, you know they're probably likely to actually potentially buy that down the road. You validated a ton of things before you even, you could do that before you even build a product, right? You can literally have a huge sign up list of people before you even build anything because you've, 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 and, and that's, a, and it's cheap. You know, like you can run ads on Facebook for like $30, $40 a day, right? You cut for like a thousand dollars. You could run an, a, a month's worth of ads, get a ton of email signups ahead of time, have validation on, on who your customer base is going to be and how you're going to reach them. All right? Great. That's why I was like, "This is that's a great idea." Um, and this is also too like, like, are you going to like? Maybe your product needs to go through a distributor or wholesaler, right? Maybe you need to sell your product in Home Hardware, Home Depot, and uh, and um, whatever Lowe's. Um, Right, that's important to think about. And have you actually thought through all the, the processes around that? Have you even had a conversation with anybody at those companies to figure out what the process is to get on the store shelf? Right, you should know all of that uh, before you're, you're you're starting to pitch. Those are things that you. So this is what I'm like to get back to my point earlier about like crafting your pitch deck. By crafting your pitch deck and going through all these steps, you're going to do a ton of work just to build your company. Right. You have to kind of do all the other stuff in order to put the deck together. Right. Um, what other important bits should I mention on here? Uh, yeah. Um, if you have some customers uh, already, um, yeah, use that information. Uh, and if you've got partners, uh, like sales partners uh, already, uh, put, those, put those on uh, the slides. Um, this one in particular is something I'll, uh, bear in mind, you really need to be clear on sort of the overall strategy. Are you B2B? Are you B2C business to customer? Basically you're selling to the everyday consumer or what they call B2B to C, meaning you're selling through a channel partner to an end consumer. An example of that is that company I mentioned earlier, Cadence Cares, helping people with estate settlement. They sell through the lawyers in the funeral homes. So when you when you when someone dies, you have to take them to a funeral home. So what they've done is that they've gone to the funeral homes. The funeral homes packages it into the funeral the funeral package, and then they sell that funeral package to the end consumer. That that end consumer directly links with Cadence, but they bought it from the funeral home. All right. So that's what B two B two C means. The strategies you need for these ones, the type of the type of people you need to bring on board are very different, right? So you can't do them all at the same time. You gotta pick one, right? And I'll say the same thing about market niches at first, pick one, right? So if you think you can do, you know, oil and gas, agriculture, um, you know, homes, you can do a bunch of different things with your technology, pick one to go after first because the, the market dynamics, the messaging, all of that, that takes a lot of work. In fact, one of the hardest parts of the startup, right, is, is figuring out this part, the approach to market. So also don't like, as I said earlier, like it's okay if you haven't all had it all figured out yet because this is, this is gonna take time to figure out. This is what's called product market fit, right? Figuring out this approach to market and really getting that all figured out. So you figured out how your product fits into the market. You figured out all the messages you need to sell. When you have that figured out, that's when your company goes like this, right? And sometimes it takes years to figure that out. Like there's companies that have taken five to 10 years just to figure out that product market fit before so they can scale. So think, make sure uh, uh, you're, you're uh, aware of that, that possibility uh, of how long this could potentially take. Um, uh, yeah, the, the selling the technology of the future is you're, you're really trying to sell the benefits. That's just like a general sales uh, strategy um, uh, on point four there. Um, yeah, that's this one too. It's like, this basically saying is like, don't tell me you're going to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. 
All right, that's basically what you're telling me here. It's like, I want to know you've got at least, like you've thought it through, as I mentioned earlier, you've, you've thought through, okay, I think our, our best customers are going to be on TikTok and YouTube Reels. So that's where we're going to focus our attention on. All right. All right. Yeah, no example for that one. Um, so yeah, revenue model. This is often uh, where we find really early stage startups haven't thought through um, this part. Uh, often we get into a, a meeting with a, with a founder and they go, how are you going to make money? And they go, figure it out. Um, so you, you really got to think this through. Um, you know, how are you charging? You know, are you, are you doing it as a, as a reoccurring revenue model of some kind? Are you doing it as a, as a um, just one-time sale? Is it priced based on uh, size of the company, number of employees that are using it? There's a ton of different pricing models out there. Um, there are also like a lot of different uh, services and examples um, that you can use to help you figure out um, what it is that the best pricing model is for you. Be careful too on the pricing model stuff. Um, if you're gonna like experiment with different pricing models, make sure you're doing it in a very friendly environment, right? Because what can happen is over time, as you build up um, more customers, if you that that aren't necessarily you know sort of your close friends and family that are willing to you know work with you on, on different, you know, like testing out different pricing models. Uh, if you need to change your pricing model because all of a sudden you're realizing that your margins aren't scaling anymore and you're not gonna actually make money in your business, uh, it can be hard to convince your customers to all of a sudden pay a whole lot more for the product because you've underpriced your product. So making sure you're appropriately priced is really, really important. All right. And this is this. There's some examples of this happening recently with Unity, for example. Uh, they've been getting into a lot of trouble with some of their developers because they changed their pricing model, and people are upset. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And so, and this this is too. It's like it's fine if you don't have a revenue model yet, right? But have an idea of like how it's going to work. Look at your competitors uh, to get a sense of benchmarks. Um, you know, like. For example, with Uber now, um, not only is there the, the pay-per-use model, but they also have like a membership fee, right? Are you going to run that type of model as well? There are there are so many different models out there now um, in, the, in the software game. You can probably find one that you can use as an example for how you should run your business. Um, yeah, mentioned earlier, make sure that pricing conversation happens uh, early. Um, and uh, yeah, try try not to get in uh, too too much uh, pure guesses when it comes to to your uh, revenue model. Um, yeah, we we try hard not to be Kevin O'Leary on Dragon's Den, but uh, if you are encountering some of them, he, this is the area where they will grill the shit out of you. Um, this is this is like, do you know your numbers, right? Um, that this is the part that you really have to. If once you've gotten going and you actually are making revenue and models, you got to know it. You got to know how much it costs for you to acquire a customer. How long once you've acquired? How long does it take for you to pay back the cost on that customer? And at what point do you start making money off of that customer, right? Um, all of that you should understand deeply and really, really well. Um, yeah, so this is an example of a company called Locrum IO um, of potential models. So you know you've got these uh, different monthly, monthly subscription models. So this is very common where you sort of have a tiered pricing system. Something's free. Free is great for like giving them a lot, like a little bit of things um, because that gets them hooked, right? People will sign up for a lot of things if they can get it for free, and then once they started using it, they're like, "Man, this is awesome! I really need to use this." And then they'll pay a little bit more, especially when it's only like, "Oh my, fifty bucks a month? That's nothing." Right, and then they're able to jump on board uh, full. Uh, something that's also great often to have on these on these type of like B two B models is like a fourth one where it's like custom. Like we'll do whatever you want for like a huge amount of money. Um, that's a good one to have. Here's another uh, example of a business model slide. So something here to keep in mind too. So this, this is like a commission um, uh, number. 
when, when businesses where you've got a large, where, where essentially you're acting as a marketplace and you're taking a commission, be careful about what you're, what you're saying as a revenue number, right? Because you can get yourself into trouble a little bit with investors. There's something called um, it's gross merchandise value uh, or gross market value. Or GMV essentially what, is what we use. Um, what that means is like, so GMV is, is the, the actual number of uh, amount that's coming in, right? So the, whatever this, you know, 10%, so say $2 billion is flowing through their system every year, right? Uh, they're taking 10% cut of that, right? So they're actually only making 200 million, right? Or did they tell, did they, on the slide, did they say 200 million as the, as this is the GMV and they're actually only making 20 million, right? So there's some confusion there when you have these type of, and if I'm getting confused as an investor, especially if I feel like maybe you're, you're giving me the bigger number to make it sound better, right? I'm going to probably crucify you on that a little bit, right? So make sure that you're very careful about what you're presenting as your revenue numbers. It's not just all the money that's flowing into your company. Sometimes when you're, when you're like a company like Uber or Airbnb, where it's all just flowing right out, you're just taking commission, right? That's, that's very, very important uh, to bear in mind. Um, yeah, so forecast, obviously it's, you know, future, um, how much money you're going to make. Um, but really what a forecast does is it shows that you have a deep, deep understanding of how your business works, right? In order to build a proper for, for forecast model, you have to know all the different little aspects of your business. You have to know like how marketing and sales works. You have to have an understanding of, okay, how much time, how many customers do we need to reach? with an ad in order for them to click on that ad and sign up for an email, right? And that so that we get, you know, 30% of the people who click on the ad sign up for the email, and then 30% of those people that sign up for the email, we'll able to, we're, we can email them and they'll set up a first meeting for a demo, and then 30% of those people will sign up for uh, a pilot, and then, you know, 10 or 20% of those people will sign up for the paid, right? You need to know all those different costs, all the different steps that go into those into your marketing and sales funnel in order to build the forecast. So the forecast really is is kind of, as I said, is this culmination of all the different aspects of your business. Because you're also going to have to understand your HR. Okay, at what point do I need to hire a second sales rep? At what point do I need to hire a CTO or a, or a fractional uh, chief operating officer to help me out? Because now I've got 20 people on my staff and I got to budget in, you know, an extra $100,000 a year to, to hire some really great exec. Right? You got to have that budgeted into your forecast at some point. Right? A great forecast model is going to have all of that baked in. So, um, yeah, if you're if you're doing it on a slide deck, though, try to use a really simple chart. Um, that's always the the best way to do it. Um, talk about your unit economics, as I mentioned, your your CAC, your customer acquisition cost, your lifetime value. You need to know your cost. Your, your COGS is your cost of goods sold. EBITDA is Earnings before interest, uh, tax, appreciation, amortization. <laughs> Trying to remember it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> got it. <laughs> uh, operating expenses, um, all that. You're, you need to know where your cash is at uh, now. Uh, you should have a really good sense of your cash flow. A really good forecast model too. Um, will have will not only have it'll give me my last. You'll give you your last twelve months, and you'll use that to pace out. Uh, your next uh, 12 to, to 18 months and do it monthly, not quarterly or yearly. Right? I really, I hate seeing forecast models that are just years at a time, right? Startups move very quickly. I want to kind of know how things are going to play out month to month. So do it as a monthly forecast. It's probably also better for you because then, because, because you're running so fast, you should have a, you should have a sense. Okay. Next month, I think I'm going to hit $10,000 in sales. All right. At the end of that month, did I hit that mark? Readjust your forecast accordingly because you're constantly adapting and changing your forecast as you go. Um, yeah, this one too, like put in your critical assumptions, like the forecast um, in the actual data room, like the actual spreadsheet that you're gonna use to create the, the, the slide, like to create the charts on your slide. Um, you need you need to really explain your assumptions in there, as I mentioned, all the different labor because that's really what, like as I mentioned, forecasts 
We all know, like literally, like I, I know investors that'll take someone like a, uh, a startup founder's forecast and just divide it in half right out of the gate and be like, I just assume you have it 50% wrong, at least, <laughs> right? And then, and then they basically they say, okay, if I, if I cut it in half, does it still, does it even still look somewhat decent, right? Like, is there, um, is it still somewhat exciting about, about the potential upside opportunity? Um, but really what, what an investor is going to do is dig through that forecast and under, try to understand um, how you came up with the numbers, right? And what, 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 this is, what this exercise on the forecast is showing people is how do you think about business? Are, have you figured out how to build your company? Have you really thought it through? Right? Um, um, yeah, this is also important, this last one here. Right, you should have sort of an idea of your milestones around uh, expected cash, like when you're going to potentially hit a cash flow positive mark, or when you're going to need to raise more capital because you run out of money. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, the detailed budget part is in. Uh, it will be in your. It will be in your data room. You don't have to get into all of it uh, in. Uh, your presentation, keep it super simple. Um, try to do, you know, I said like bottom up, right? So this is like real customers. So when, it, when you're when we're talking about a bottom up, you need to be doing it, say, based off of your sales pipeline. So as I mentioned earlier, you're talking about that marketing funnel. So I have 300 email signups. I think I can close 10 of them next month. How many, how much sales will that get me, right? What's in my pipeline? How is that going to reflect into my next month of sales, right? And keep going from there, right? As opposed to, you know, I think I can capture 10% of the market. So in year five, right, I'm going to have 50% of a $10 billion market, and I'm just going to work back from that number. That those that that no, those in particular are total bullshit. <laughs> when investors look at those, um, yeah, so this this is also a good one too. Uh, like everything is going to go up and to the right. Super exciting. You're going to make a ton of revenue. Um, but does your costs stay the same or do they scale at the same rate? Right? If you're if you're if your costs like like you just have to keep hiring more people at the same rate that you add more revenue, that doesn't do you any good. One of the reasons why people love software as a service companies, you build it once, you can sell it to a thousand people. Right or more, hundreds of millions of people, really. Um, so that's that's why it's uh, really important. Um, I think I've talked about a bunch of this other stuff already. Yeah, the screenshots of the spreadsheets is really frustrating. I hate when people do that. Like just total like screenshots of the spreadsheets, and it's like just tons of numbers all of a sudden. You're just like, Ugh! you can do that. You can do this on like a leave behind deck, right? Don't do it in a pitch deck, like when you're pitching it live. Um, so yeah, this one can be a little like, if, if I look at the graph and I can't understand it like in five seconds, it's not a good graph. All right, so this one's because of all these different, the colors are kind of the similar. So I gotta like spend a minute here going, okay, so this is that, and then that is that, and then that means that, and okay. So like, what is this telling me even, right? So I'm going to spend about 30 seconds just trying to figure out what this means, and then you're going to move on to the next slide, and I'll probably want to have paid attention to anything that you said because I was staring at this graph trying to figure out what it means. Right. Also this, this is what I was talking about, putting spreadsheets. This is terrible. Right. But it would be a good reason, wouldn't it? If you got someone and they, okay, I don't want to further. Yeah. Bullshit yeah. I, I wouldn't also I wouldn't put this much data like even this I wouldn't put necessarily in a leave behind deck I would take some sort of summary of like asset or like this is a balance sheet too this is like useless I wouldn't want to put this in any yeah exactly like this is too like that like this balance sheet information is too much if I was what I would give somebody it would be uh, like a like some forecast like a like a sh small forecast table right that has like Here's what we're going to make in Q, like over the next few quarters, potentially, right? Sort of laying out the, the plan ahead and how exciting it's going to be. Um, yeah, so milestones, 
you know, where are you going? You know, what's, what's, and, and part of this is also where have you been, right? So often when people put milestone slides, they sort of show a track record to date. Something that's often said in the VC world is we invest in lines, not dots. What that means is, is that we're, we're investing in, in something that's moving over time. So we want to know, we want to see the different points on the graph and how you've moved, how you've graded traction. I want to understand how fast you've been moving over time. We like, in Q1, we had, you know, no revenue. By Q2, we were at 100,000. By the end of the year, we did a million. Like, we grew really fast in year one. Like, okay, that's crazy exciting, right? I know you're moving really quickly. Um, by next year, we're going to be at 2 million. The year after, we're going to be at five. Like, that, that's all, all super exciting. Um, if you're going to, product's going to change. If you're going to recruit, if you created some team members, you, you're going to sign a strategic partnership coming up with somebody. Um, you got to understand sort of what that plan is, how you're going to progress along it. Um, and, 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 and all of these things that you identify as milestones should show me that you're going to move this company in a direction where you're going to make a ton of value. Um, and this is also, also too, like set these sort of milestones. Right, recurring revenue. I actually don't know what some of these mean. Um, <laughs> again, don't use all these acronyms because they're hard to understand. Um, it's like a game called bullshit. Yeah, yeah. So we could just like make try to make these ones up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> could be fun. Um, yeah, and so and this one's too is really really important, right? When with with the investors is I need to understand that the milestones that you're setting, that you're going to hit with this round of investment. So what often happens around this point, around milestones or getting into the ask slide, is we're raising a million dollars so we can reach 100,000 customers by the end of next year. Right? I need to know that if you were to hit 100,000 customers by the end of next year, that that's going to lead to more funding or an acquisition offer from somebody I need to know that that's, that's going to progress my potential for a return on my investment forward, right? That, that's really what that's about. Um, and, and sometimes it can even be about like we're going we're gonna to use this money so we can develop XYZ features, right? And if we develop more of these features, we're going to be able to close more customers. And we think that, you know, like we've talked to some VCs. If we build the, the product into this, they've told us that they'd be interested in financing us. Okay, perfect. Well, now we we know we're working towards some, something. Um, yeah, this one at the top here, right? Downloads of something uh, is a useless stat. Anybody know why it's a useless stat? Because you don't know who's downloading. Doesn't tell me about usage. It's like views. Yeah, like yeah, exactly. It's like views on a lot of products, especially on Twitter these days, where it's like if you just like flick through it. And like look at it, they'll count that as a view. Um, so be very careful about those sort of like milestones around things, like what you're setting. I want it to be something that actually directly translates to something that that uh, shows that there's going to be an increase in uh, in revenue uh, because of that metric. Um, yeah, avoid the sort of those rosy projections. As I said, they will come back to haunt you um, if you overset as a, you overset your valuation based on rosy projections. Oh, well, we think we're going to hit, you know. Five million by next year, or we should be worth, you know, fifty million dollars today, because we're going to get there. Oh uh, yeah, okay, good luck. Like when you when you don't hit those numbers, now all of a sudden, now you've got to figure out how to raise money at a lower multiple. Everybody gets upset because the company's not worth less. Yada yada. Um, yeah, this one is another one too. <laughs> grant money. Grant money is great. I mentioned grant money earlier but it's no substitute for customer validation, right? Just because you're getting your grant money, checks a bunch of boxes for me as an investor, right? But it usually is nowhere near good enough for me to say uh, versus like what you're actually getting from the customers. Grant money just helps you figure that out, right? That's really what the money's for. The money's to help you figure out the customer validation side, right? Um, Yeah, and the testimonials, yeah, be careful on the testimonials in the slide deck. Um, when it comes to testimonials, at some point during the due diligence process, I'm going to want to meet with your customers. That's when I'm going to get the testimonials on whether or not your product's great. Um, but, 
Yeah, it is a good idea though um, to put up logos of this. I like these are all the companies that we're working with. Like, if you've got a bunch of big logos, that's going to excite me to get me into that first meeting, and then we can go from there, right? Because again, coming back to the really the important part of the whole pitch deck, what are you trying to achieve with it? You're trying to get a meeting, right? You're trying to get them to meet with you. And I guess the logos are the same thing as throwing out a name. Make sure you got permission to use those logos because you're going to go and ask someone if you recognize that logo. Yeah. Yeah. And make sure it's like, yeah, it's ironclad. It's actually signed. Right. You can also put in, like, I've often seen in decks, like, these are ones that we're in conversation with, or, you know, we've entered into, you know, price negotiation, like, where there's something already signed, but you haven't finalized the deal, or we're in a pilot project and these ones are in full swing and you can kind of show that progression that's also something that i like to see because that also that kind of shows okay here's what you've got now here's what's coming right um yeah so this one's great this is a template uh for a timeline you know just shows so basically i would say like you should be here right so this is like show me like three things that got you here this is where you are right. Yeah, this is just the example. It's Lauren. So yeah. So so like this is where you are right now. So this is where I would this is where I would do if I was a founder. I would put like three things that got me to where I am, right? And three things that are gonna get me to where I wanna go. Yeah. So there's kind of an example. I wanna start a business Right? <laughs> Uh, here's another example of, of milestones, um, and, and you can see that they've got, you know, timelines. As you can see here, right, everything is related to, like, the metrics that they're putting up are related to revenue. In fact, they put the revenue figures on there when they hit certain user numbers, right? Like, integrated into apps gives them more reach to get more users, right? So that's what makes that exciting. And, the, like, launching the API leads into this. API, like for those that don't, in this case, API is like the type of software that allows you to integrate into somebody else's software. Um, a, a, B, uh, D. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, if you can get these two things across in, a, in an elevator pitch three seconds, uh, you will likely get them to pay attention to longer. Um, great euphemism. Um, actually, I won't get that. I think we hit it on last time. Team, basically, is one of the most important aspects. Do not skimp on your team slide. Okay? A lot of people skimp on this one. Uh, I've seen some decks that don't even have it in it when they send it to me. I have a very hard time wanting to take a meeting if I have no idea who's building the thing, right? So, and this one in particular, I see this happen all the time. They don't highlight the experience, right? If like, if you've got an advisor that's a VP at Microsoft, right? Which Gord has access to, which is entirely possible. <laughs> or is, is someone that works at MIT. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, put that on your slide deck. Get permission from them first, but put that on your slide deck that they have that experience. That and that that that's exciting to me, especially in certain industries. Like if you've got an advisor that works or has worked with a company that could potentially acquire a business, that's really exciting, right? Because that means that I now have more evidence to support the claim that you are gonna get acquired by Attachee if you've got the former CEO of Attachee Power Canada as one of your advisors. Um, something that, to think about too, um, they, they mentioned here like show, the, show any holes. I, I, don't really like, I don't really like like that necessarily. You should have a good idea of that though. That is a, that is a question that's gonna get asked in the first meeting is where are the gaps in your current team uh, what, what do you feel like you need to, to feel, fill? Uh, you should have, uh, ideally, if you're, if you're, um, if you've got a great team, you should have a, a mix of different folks on your team already. Um, in particular, if you're doing something with deep technology, you should have someone on your team with really deep technology 
experience, right? There should be someone who's an expert in that tech. Um, what, what I'm looking for here is, is team problem fit. So if, if your team um, is the right team to solve this problem, they're gonna have all the different aspects. They're gonna have that industry experience and uh, be able to back it up. Sorry. Um, yeah. As I mentioned earlier, we're investing in the jockey, not the horse. That was the example I was going to use. Um, yeah. The, everybody loves a great C title. Um, just use founders, co-founders, right? Um, you don't need to come up with a title, especially this early on, right? You don't really know necessarily what's going to develop or take over time and giving away all these titles. To people, especially early on when you're a really small team um, and you've got like maybe some potentially quite junior people and you start giving them C titles and then eventually you got to go out and actually hire somebody who's actually like a C-suite person for a large company. Uh, you're going to have some very awkward conversations with your current employees when you tell them that they're, sorry, you're going to get demoted. Um, so it's way easier to start with something that's super neutral than try to, to start with something that, that creates a lot of baggage that you're going to have to deal with later. Um, yeah, so be careful as, as well on the advisor stuff. This has happened. This has also happened to folks before. I've had people who have claimed, oh, yeah, this person said they were going to be on my board. I called that person. They're like, no, I didn't. Right. Um, we will check. The stuff that you put on your deck, so if you say someone's an advisor to you, make sure they're actually an advisor to you. Uh, they didn't just meet with you one time, and then you put them on their deck. Also, don't put your lawyer <laughs> or your accountant or anything like that, like any sort of service provider. They're not an advisor. They're not a member of your team. They're a contracted service provider. They don't add anything extra to your deck. Everyone has a lawyer. Everyone has an accountant. It's not that special. So uh, be careful about that. We've uh, we've had folks do that, too. Um uh, put put the lawyer on the deck. Um, um, yeah, and then I mentioned too. I mentioned this earlier. Like, if if you, if you have a rock star or key person, or like you've built this huge team, put it at the top so it gets me super hooked right from the very beginning. Um, that, yeah, put the team slide earlier, right? Where uh, like we've got the team to like you can do it. You can do it literally like introduction first slides team. I've seen it. Like after the, the the solution slide as well, right? This is a solution. Here's who's built it and why we're going to solve it. Like, but just think about it. Really, what you have to think about is the narrative and the storytelling. How does the team the conversation fit into the narrative and the storytelling you're doing? I promise we're almost done. I know you guys all want to get to lunch. Um, just going to wrap it up. Here's the last one: um, is ask. So even if you're not raising money, you should always have an ask. Something. If you're in front of an audience of people, have some sort of call to action. We're looking for introductions to customers. We're looking for advisors. We're looking to hire some developers, right? All of those are legitimate reasons, uh, things that you could put on your ask slide if you're not wasting money. Um, if you are using money, um, tell me how you're going to spend it, right? You should have at least some sort of breakdown, some sort of buckets. Um, you know, we're raising a hundred thousand, we're raising a million dollars, 50% is going to go to marketing and sales. 25% is going to go to product development. Uh, 25% uh, going to go to uh, additional human resources, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. At least then I have, and then we have a starting point for the conversation about, okay, how, how does spending those money in those different areas help us get to those next milestones? Um, yeah, this is. Not good. Have a particular number in mind because this what this tells me is like you don't know like how much money you need to get to where you're going. You should have a number in mind of, of how much money you need to get to where you're going. Very specifically, like and that's a three times difference. yeah, massively. Which also and then the other thing too to keep in mind is um, from a dilution. There's a rule of twenty percent uh, is the maximum you should take as dilution on a round. So. Like this range changes the valuation of your company dramatically depending on how much dilution you want to take, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> this one too. <laughs> like I don't, I don't 
I don't really care how much work you've put on this business. It, that doesn't affect the valuation. Like you, you could tell me like you've spent 20 years working on this. That doesn't matter. I'm sorry. I, I get it. Like time does equal money in some respects, but at the same time, the valuation of your company is dependent on a broad range of different things. And the amount of time you spent working on it is not one of them, unfortunately. Um, yeah. And, and just being careful too, yeah, with your, with your audience, um, you know, like what you're asking for, um, in particular, uh, you need to understand, like, sort of cater your ask to your audience, right? And that's regardless of the money situation. So if you're in front of a room of, like, there's no investors and it's just a bunch of community people, um, you know, just ask the community for help. Like, that's really what you're there for. You're asking, like, I'm asking for your support. I'm asking for connections. Maybe it's, like, I'm asking for folks to introduce me to potential investors, right? You can do that. Those are all uh, options. And I, I honestly, like, with this, and be wary of just, like, don't put numbers on your on, on your ask slide. Say like we're raising a pre-seed round of investment. We'd like to talk. That way you're not pigeonholing yourself into a number, right? You can have that conversation in the meeting. If you've done enough through the rest of the presentation, I'll take the meeting, even though you haven't had a very specific number and stuff in mind. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. I don't know if we, we could probably go through a bunch more, but I'll leave it there. Yeah, we'll leave it there. And then we can, and I think, and you can add it for three hours. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I put in the event right details for, uh, and I know this people were. So I, you're going to have people talking to you tonight. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Um, my email is jesse at startupteenty.com. You can put it in the chat too if you want. Um, feel free to shoot me an email. If you're interested in learning more, I highly recommend you check out the Startup TNT website and our YouTube page. We have a ton of resources. We've got some playlists on there um, for some of the best entrepreneur education sessions that we've done. I sent a couple um, of the best ones to Gord. He'll share those with you. Um, highly recommend you check those out. Um, yeah. Every Thursday night at Innovation Place at U of R. No, in, in Regina, it's uh, at Cathedral Social Hall most weeks. Um, uh, tonight, uh, funnily enough, tonight it's an innovation place in Regina. Uh, but uh, yeah, we have a regular happy hour in Regina. We have a regular happy hour in Saskatoon. Uh, feel free to join us uh, for either of those. We also have a newsletter. Uh, you just go to the website. You scroll down to the bottom. Uh, you can sign up for the newsletter. We provide uh, information about workshops like this one um, that we do and that some of our partners do. Uh, there's also updates on our program, which is called the Investment Summit, where there's an opportunity for you to pitch to real investors for real money. Um, and if you're not ready to, to actually get the money, uh, you're going to get feedback. You're going to learn. Um, it's a great experience. I highly recommend you check that out. Uh, Gord will have more details on that program as well if you want to talk to him a bit about it. And, of course, tonight I'd be happy to talk to anybody about our program. Yeah. So with that, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.